come up. He will be acting as our Master of Ceremonies this morning. Jean-Paul? Bonjour, bonjour à toutes et à tous. Good morning, everyone. You won't be surprised to hear that we're going to be speaking French a bit this morning, as well as English. That's the charm of our wonderful organisation. Director General, Deputy Directory General, President of the CA, International Directions, Members, I'm very happy to be greeting you this morning to open the first Postal Innovation Forum organised here at the Universal Postal Union. It's a forum that I wanted to set up as part of the POC because the topic of innovation is fundamental. Perhaps some of you will recall that Two years ago, during the pandemic, we organised an online forum entitled A Meeting with the Future, looking at innovation. That session is still online and you can find it if you want to. I think that there are some statements, including from people who are in this room, which are still of great interest constantly seeking to improve what we currently have is what innovation is. In postal services have to innovate to adapt to technological advance, to behavioural change, as well as other transformations. And we also have to be part of this change. The UPU has already mobilised to develop digital services. Creating the dot post group is a key example of this. And we're currently celebrating, it, celebrating its 10th anniversary. The Postal Technology Centre itself is increasingly seeking innovation and to make use of new digital technologies. There are many different areas. Artificial intelligence, high-speed data processing, all allow for swifter software. The cloud and blockchain as well are also paths to explore. Innovation is one of the priorities of the Abidjan strategy and a committee of the POC has been given a mandate to look at this topic. As you heard yesterday, it will allow for experiences to be shared as well as be imitated within the postal sector as well as the, for the development of new projects. But we must do more. We must join together our efforts so that we can continue to improve quality of service for our customers and our citizens and respond to their expectations. This forum, which will now be held annually throughout this cycle, will allow us to be even more mobilised. We will be looking to take advantage of uh, your presence here at this first forum and please do make any suggestions uh, for our upcoming forum. This is a major event in dealing with innovation, accelerating uh, the accelerating competitiveness that we're seeing as well as the needs of our societies which are all an important backdrop. I wish to you a successful forum and without delay we have invited Dr. Robert Giesendana Tobin, who is from the EPFL from Lausanne, to provide us with some food for thought to start the day off and to look at the need to innovate, not just in the postal sector, but a bit in a broader perspective. We are so grateful that he has come to join us this morning. Yes, thank you very much from, also from my side. It's an honor to be here today um, to talk about innovation. 
It's also an honor to be the keynote speaker today to open this forum of innovation, which is the third of a long series, as I heard. And I have the mission to inspire you, maybe to give the impulse for today. I prepared a presentation. I have some slides, but I know if it's, if it's coming. So maybe some words on my person. On my, um, I am um, an alumnus from the APFL. The APFL is the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in the French speech, from the French-speaking part of, the, of, of Switzerland. Um, I did a PhD in aerospace. I worked 15 years in a big corporate, and I'm back at the university since four years now at the interface between industry and academia. But our role is really to transfer what's happening in the university and research side to have an impact on society. So I think we, I can share today some elements which are facing how can we best transfer the knowledge we have in our deep tech universities around the world, also in Switzerland, to society to have a positive impact for a better future. And I'm waiting for the, for, for the slide. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. Great, thank you very much. I thought pictures brings more than a lot of words, so I would start with some, some, some I have some slides to, to, to follow the, the presentation today. So maybe if you can just switch to the, to the, to the next slide, please. Yeah, so if you look at uh, more generally, I have an interesting survey of McKinsey 2020 looking at innovation and uh, the innovation is a critical topic for, for all the industry around the world. And if you look, all the CEO believe uh, in the survey that innovation is critical for the future. I would say at that time, 2020 is the COVID crisis. If you look what's happening now with the energy crisis, with the war, with the climate, which is getting more emergent and the signal we see from around the world that we have to act I think innovation is key and in every mouth. If you look at the other numbers, yeah, that you see that's not that easy. We can talk about innovation. We know that innovation is key, but uh, the CEO says, okay, they have the expertise and the resources in-house to solve the problem, only 21%. But then if it comes to the performance, it's around 6%, which is very low. So what, what is the challenge? Um, so I think it is mainly in the execution of innovation. We can have a vision, and if you go to the next slide, please. And if you think about, uh, about the vision, I had an interesting talk this morning, and I heard, okay, yeah, it's important to have this vision. You know, this far, where do we want to go, okay? Uh, you can have great ideas at the beginning, and the, 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 the travel in between can be as easy like this. You can even start making an e-bike at the beginning to be, in for, to be faster at the, at the goal. But if you look at the reality, and if you go to the second slide, if you look at the reality, it looks much more different. This is real life. This is what's happening. So you start, and you start maybe alone at the beginning, and then you realize, oh, oh, there's a challenge on the road, okay? Um, and the thing is, you can only draw this map when you arrive at the goal. So you don't know what, what you're facing on the travel. So the only way to move forward when talking about innovation, you need collaboration. At the beginning, you need collaboration, you support internal of the company, maybe around your friends, family, when we talk about small companies. If you're a big corporate, you need sponsors inside the company, of course you need money, um, and then you move forward. Time comes, and you will need external partner. You need collaboration with external partner to support you where you don't have the expertise to move forward. And important looking at this is, you need these quick wins. You need these quick wins in the, in, in the middle, okay? Because it's long lasting. It will take a long time to move from A to B, from the, from the start to the end. So we'll, you need this at, 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 uh, in, in between. Uh, and also important is about the, um, the structure of your company. Depending on how you are structured, the culture you have in the company, uh, the, the way you're working, the size, 
uh, you will facing different challenges. Some structure will help you to move faster, some other structure will harm you and you will take longer. So it's really about, it's not about technology only, it's about the culture of the company, the structure, the way you are built, the governance you have in the company, the partners you can find, and it's all about, uh, you know, you don't know what you don't know. So you have to find out what are the missing, asking the right question, and this takes time. And now talking about innovation, we talk about ideas, where do these in the ideas come from? Maybe the next slide, please. Um, and I thought maybe this is a great picture. Uh, it's about 2006, maybe you know about that. It was about uh, the Chindral Hospital in, in the UK. They were facing challenging at the handoff between the surgery and the intensive care. And there were some really critical uh, issues in these handoffs. Uh, and the way they solved the problem, they looked at what's happening on the Formula One. They looked at how the team Ferrari worked and how did they manage the handoff, how they're working. And looking what's happening on topics which are absolutely not linked to each other, they were able to increase, uh, to be better in the handoffs and decrease by more than 40% the critical issues during handoff. So the message is here, when we're doing innovation, it's about and innovation new ideas appear at the interface between domains. And these domains can be brought as uh, hobbies, tradition, uh, biology, painting, uh, blockchain. So you can mix all the domains uh, and at the interface of these domains uh, appears the, 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 the new ideas. Maybe the next slide. So these are two domains. Now coming back a bit to EPFL, uh, the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Lausanne. We are also two, at, at, at the interface between two different worlds. On one side, we have the academia. On the other side, we have the industry. And these are, for history, extremely disconnected. Uh, I was working in the corporate for a long time, and to be honest, it was quite challenging work with that academia because of the timeline and, you know, it's not solving my problem directly. So, yeah, we are facing this challenge. You see on the one side, we have the research and academia. They focus on invention and publication, doing great research, great discovery. On the other side of industry, where, you know, the pressure is there, you have to find solution. So what, what, how can we link both worlds to make, to make it happen? And exactly the same way, when it, comparing to Formula One and surgery, we're exactly in the same, in the same tension. So here, what we can do is, of course, talking about research collaboration, what we put in place over time is account management, someone which takes care of the company, understand what are the problem, and links it to the academia. And also supporting researchers to get the knowledge what's happening in industry, to understand how to move, where to put the research, where to put the energy on. And of course, one way of transferring the knowledge to the society is the creation of startups. Uh, we can also talk about it. And also an important, not forget, on academia side, is the talents and the continuous education. It was a topic this morning. University is also there for, not only for educating our PhD masters when you are just ready for the, for the, for the industry or for the, the, for, the, for, the, um, for the career, but afterwards, in the companies, to upskill the people you have on board over time with the new knowledge, to be sure they're able to take off what's happening in, in the academia to be ready for the future and implement what's happening outside. Next slide, please. So now, going a bit deeper in the PFL, what are we talking about? So on one side, we have uh, the PFL, we are talking about 350 labs. A lab is a professor, it's a structure. Uh, often we call it a small SME because there's a lot of independence. It can be quite big, like 40 people on board. It's focused on one specific topic. We are covering different topics from life science, computer science, engineering, uh, architecture, basic science, civil engineering, etc. If you look at the amount of people we have on the academia side, we are close to 70,000 people. On the other side, we have the chance to have the innovation park, which is linked to the, to the campus. And on this campus, on this Epifel Innovation Park, we have the chance to have 150 startups. It grows over time, but today we have 150 startups. We are around about 330 corporates, which are on the campus. So if you sum it, we're close to 2,600 people on the, on, the, on the campus and in the innovation park. So if you sum it up, we're close to 20,000 people with 120 nationalities. So great. Well, it's diversity at large, you have all the technology. How can I source this? How can I take it to solve my problem? And that's what we are doing. We are this interface. And you look over time, more than 400 startups went through the APFL and through the APFL Innovation Park. 
Thank you. Uh, if you look at the investment, which is a good indicator of what's happening, if there's interest from the venture caps, if the technology makes sense, we are close to 4.5 billion which were invested in our, in our startup and research. 50 companies went through. And uh, of course, the PFL is not alone. You need the ecosystem which is around, or the universities, the institution which is around, the people, the city, everything makes sense. If you put the PFL in the desert, it will have not the same impact, for sure. Next slide. Thank you. And to push it further, okay, um, we thought about how can we support, and that's, that's how can we allow companies to connect to the academia. So it's all about make them understand. It's about education, understanding how can I connect to the ecosystem. So when we are collaborating with other companies, with, with partners, is really get to understand what are the needs of the others, okay? Can we support each other? Can we find a win-win collaboration between um, among us, okay? To move forward and together build the future. And what we put in place is we call it Canova. It comes from Kilo Nova, maybe you heard about it. It's the image of the fusion, the merger of two neutron stars, and these two neutron stars, academia and industry, producing heavy metals like gold and platinum. Next slide, please. So, but we're thinking further. Uh, this was the last 30 years. Uh, some great results, we're happy, um, but it's not enough. Today, or in the future, if we want to solve the big problems of society, there's not one lab, one startup will solve the problem. We have to find a combination of those. So what we are looking at is the next generation of innovation park. We call it Ecotope, which is uh, the minimum viable element where all different ecosystems are in it. And we talk about, uh, we want to enlarge the community. We're talking about community of community, okay? We're talking about, of course, the innovators which are already on board, the APFL which is already on board, but more and more strategic partner, NGOs, part of it, politics, regulation, uh, public authorities, citizens, okay, service providers, and you have to mix it to make it available that you can link these different parties together to make them understand what is at stake, what are the problems, what are the opportunities, and support them in finding interaction and develop the future. So we are talking uh, about co-dream, co-create, and co-learn. Of course, we will make failure, but we have to learn on it and continue to dream to, to imagine the future. Next slide. And, uh, okay, community, you can make it digital um, today, but we think uh, a surface is key. You need someone where can, people can meet. So we are imagining the future of the APFL Innovation Park, and we have the chance, you know, in Switzerland, um, it's not that easy to find a surface to build, to build something. Um, uh, but we have the chance next to the APFL, we have 240, 240,000 square meters where we want to develop an innovation industry uh, technology district. And on this surface, we want to build uh, what we call our flagship building, the Ecotope, to think about the future, to bring people together, to think about the future, to make sense out of technology and solve the problem. Not only talking about technology, talking about all the other elements which is important regarding innovation, we talk about business model. We can talk about um, ethical aspects, political, regulation, how these elements can play together to build the future. And with these words, I want to thank you. Uh, maybe you have some questions on that, and I hope I could give you the energy I have and where I get my energy to support you in the, in the forum uh, uh, the next uh, the, today. Merci beaucoup, professor. Thank you so much, Professor. Are there any questions? While well, we have the professor with us, the first question is always the most difficult. If it comes, Jose. Of course, we want to ask you how Swiss Post uh, is benefiting from this ecosystem uh, uh, with the EPFL. So Swiss Post is a long uh, partner since a long time. Uh, they're involved in what we call our Center for Digital Trust, where they look at uh, the elements of uh, cybersecurity, blockchain, the algorithms linked to that. And uh, we're very happy because uh, Swiss Post also started the program Knova, which I presented to you, to explore and to better understand how can I connect to the academia to get most out of it. And it's really beyond technology on that front, it's really about the talents, 
to structures, maybe also collaboration with other industry partners and startups we have in the campus. Une autre question? Any other questions? No? No regrets about that? Okay, we well, thank you very much for your intervention. It was really very, very interesting. Nous allons donc pas... So now we're going to move on to the second part of our morning. And I would like to invite the Deputy Director General, who is going to be hosting this session, as well as the Chair of the Council of Administration, and I will be joining them myself. The interpreters apologize, but we do not have any sound for the speaker. But let me This one is working. We will share. It's all about collaboration at the end. <laughs> I was, uh, in a way, thinking uh, how to start uh, and to address, in a way, uh, my dear colleagues and friends, uh, and in a way, welcome with you uh, today. You know, it's, it's a fireside chat. Uh, we don't have fire. Uh, we don't have a red wine, but we will have, I hope, uh, a nice chat, and I'll, I hope we will be able to bring you some of the thoughts of uh, my colleagues. Allow me to introduce them, uh, and they are, in a way, uh, a good example uh, how small is world, actually. When I was young, Jean-Paul was, as a student in my country, that was in the late 70s. We never met at that time, of course. When uh, Isaac was a young student, Jean-Paul was his professor. So the world is really small. Please give him a round of applause for those two panels. In, in, in the world, we are delivering 85 million packages and documents per day. And digital transformation is apparently valid 1.5 trillion US dollars. So this uh, uh, humble panel will try to, in a way, give you some thoughts about the innovation. Uh, within UPU, uh, we decided, together with Director General Metoki-san, uh, part of executive management, that we will endorse innovation. And again, innovation is all about cooperation and collaboration, and this is the way how we will proceed. We will try to offer innovative and affordable solution for all of you. So, uh, with this introduction, uh, allow me also to explain uh, innovation we started today. We have here a laptop which indicates three minutes, meaning that when I will try to ask questions, the panelists have three minutes time to be concise and to provide you with their answer. And this is maybe something that we will try to introduce also in the future. This is in a way innovation we were able to see uh, during the ICAO Congress in Montreal in Canada. And at the end, if I may uh, uh, add something, last week I was in Frankfurt uh, opening the uh, Parcel Post Expo. Now they have changed the name. And uh, there was a lady, uh, Kate Muth. She is a new or old CC member. And she asked me, uh, Mr. Oswald, uh, why or is it possible that UPU can be as fast as the private sector when it comes to innovation? And you know, I, my answer was, 
If I'm honest, I can only say no. We cannot be as fast as private sector, but I can promise you that we will do our best to be faster. Thank you. So good morning, gentlemen, again. Bonjour. You had a nice breakfast this morning? <laughs> oui. Indeed, we did. Thank you. Collaboration, yes. Okay. Uh, would you like to say something at the beginning, or just can I start with questions? How do you see it? I've already spoken this morning, so in fact, I'll let the Chair of the Council of Administration speak. Well, in order to be more innovative, I think what I'll do, first of all, is just to say good morning to everyone, and then allow us to just take questions and innovate that way. Uh, I have in a way prepared three uh, uh, questions and uh, let's start with the first one. Um, Jean-Paul, if I may start with you, uh, being the younger uh, uh, member of this panel, innovation within UPU family, uh, can you endorse it? Jean-Paul, you are in a way uh, a lifelong member of Post-Europe where we had a very nice collaboration in the last 15 years, if I may say so, and you uh, were always endorsing innovation when it comes to European designated operators uh, environment. How uh, you see this in the UPU environment? Thank you for that question. And given that you've referred to post-Europe, the funny thing is Right now, Post-Europe is organizing its own innovation forum. So I think that's uh, quite an interesting coincidence. There's room here at UPU for innovation. And in fact, nobody waited for us to start innovating. With other uh, posts, with other uh, Postal Technology Centers, we've already begun innovating. The creation within Committee 3 of a working group on innovation is something that goes in line with that and broadens it. This is just the outset. We can see this as us setting off on a path. And I when I see the chair of the consultative committee with us in the room this morning, I think of when we were thinking about the consultative committee and I thought perhaps we're going to need to find a way to attract here startups, to get them into the ecosystem, ones that are already in the postal ecosystem, and to get them to push us, to drive us, to give us new ideas. Postal services themselves, and I think we'll come back to this, shouldn't try to invent everything themselves. And the professor just said that to us. They have to, we, to look around and see what's being done elsewhere see what's taking place in society, in the economy, look around and see what can be done to help the postal services uh, be more efficient. We are old houses. The, the French postal system is 470 years old. Our agents have that mindset, perhaps. Now, perhaps that's not the same in all countries, but all the same, we need to stimulate our postal services. We have to get a revolution to be underway. We as the UPU, but also postal businesses need to be looking forward to innovation, something that we can start here 
a place where we can see ideas coming from across the world, going across the world, in order to enable innovation. Thank you. Your views on innovation within the UPO family, being a CA chair and also director general of Cote d'Ivoire Post. Um. Mm, thank you. I think for those who've been here for a long time within the postal sector, we can be proud of the many things that have already been done. And we've seen confirmation this morning that the global postal world has innovated and has made progress. If you look at the UPU family, I think that undoubtedly, and Jean-Paul already mentioned this, it is time for us to take a step further towards innovation. We have a good culture of innovation already here in UPU. What we perhaps need to do now is go beyond classic innovation and be more open, go towards open innovation. That might be the brick that's lacking uh, in the edifice that we're building. That would enable us, each and every one of us, to have this dynamic come into play. Something that we're all looking for, where we're opening UPU to wider postal sector members, uh, but in fact, industry, the postal industry, is something that is made up of a family, an important family that can build an ecosystem. We need to have that rich soil in order to get the ecosystem going, and it needs to be something that is worldwide. If we don't open ourselves to open innovation, if we don't look at research institutes, if we don't go to the universities, academia, the private sector, Already, a lot of that is in place. Now that it's in place, we need to take the next step. Go toward open innovation and, well, as the professor was saying, I was very pleased to hear him say, we just need to get to the next step now. That's what our family, our UPU family, should do. We have postal operators who uh, perhaps are, are at the same distance from one another, but and they too can turn themselves towards open innovation and enrich each other. If we have a platform, well, I, I don't think that I'm the only entity capable of setting up an ecosystem, but I think that in our postal system, we have private sector looking at us, in research institutes looking at us, governments looking at us. I think this is our time and I think we're, we're ready. Uh, merci, uh, Isaac. Um, in a way, now it's, I think, time also to share my experience um, five or six years ago in my previous um, organization, we were trying to sell uh, a building, uh, meaning we were decreasing the, the number of units and we were not able to sell it. And then at the end, somebody came up with an idea. Let's invite uh, startups who are in a way close to logistics environment and give them some kind of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, small rent just to cover the cost and try to, in a way, take advantage of this cooperation. So it was, in a way, a really a nice experience we had at that time. Um, uh, just an idea for everybody. Uh, uh, Isaac, uh, second question, role of governments in innovation. Innovation is not only about technology, innovation in a way uh, is dealing with all segments of our life. I had a, a nice chat uh, during the presentation uh, with uh, Jean-Paul when I said, oh, this is in a way frightening if surgeons in hospitals are taking good examples from Formula One but role of uh, uh, governments in innovation, Isaac, please. No, no. I think perhaps we ourselves should 
change our software. Governments don't have any difficulties with innovation, with the idea of innovation. That nourishes them. Now, perhaps we can feed into what they want to do, experts, etc. Each time we've organized a debate inviting governments to come and validate resolutions, for example, we haven't made any progress. So perhaps what we need to do is change the model, the way we work with governments, and tell them we are the ones who can be that development pillar, economic and social development pillar for them. And that is something that hits the heart of what they're looking for. When we show them that the postal industry is something that governments uh, are lucky to have, that can help them with their financial inclusion, digital inclusion, energy inclusion, governments will, will say to us, what is the solution? Because we can accompany you, accompany you if you have it. They want to know what the contribution is that we can make. How can we improve the lives of populations? What drives them? is the political discourse. We're in power. We're here to accompany you. We can make your lives better. So it depends on us first. And governments are waiting to see what we can give them, what that magic formula is going to be. We talk about the climate. We talk about financial inclusion. We talk about poverty in certain areas of our continents or of the world. We try to improve the supply chain, improve uh, distribution, serve our citizens. But who has the tool to provide those solutions? It is the postal sector. The postal sector has to go to governments and have the governments validate the uh, steps that we're taking. But if we have to invite governments to come and be part of it to have resolutions, to talk about the budget, to decide whether or not this point or that point goes in line with what they want. I think I should say that I'm young enough now, but once I'm older, people are going to say, look, you haven't changed anything in the matrix that you've got. They're waiting to see what we're going to bring that's new so that we can in the end, be the game changer. I think the people who are in government uh, have that culture as well. Isaac, Jean-Paul, um, French La Poste plays an important role in French society, I know. And uh, many years ago, I don't know if that's still a practice today, uh, I've heard that the um, state is subsidizing delivery of newspapers because there is an interest that people are reading. Nowadays, with the social networks and uh, things have changed dramatically, unfortunately, in the negative way. But anyway, uh, you being a, a, a national operator in France, what kind of role government can play or should play to foster innovation? Merci. Thank you. That is an excellent question, Marjan. Let me begin by saying that when President Macron was elected, he wanted to change France into a startup nation. And in fact, sometimes uh, it wasn't something that people uh, welcomed, but he was in that frame of mind. Now, after that, you can see there's the motivation, but then you have to try and turn that into action. He tried to continue on with efforts that had been made by his predecessors, encourage startups to try and facilitate things for them with uh, tax incentives, to try and enable a fabric to be woven in all sectors was part of what he wanted to do. And what struck me was that you have ministers, you have the cabinet, and there are young people in those cabinets. 
I was in one of those ministerial cabinets years and years ago, so I know what things are like uh, behind those closed doors. And La Poste can't see that, or they don't see it anymore, or they didn't see it anymore until the COVID pandemic. So what was at stake for us was that we had to demonstrate, first of all, that La Poste had changed. And I can tell you now that between our sorting centers that we had when I started 40 years ago and the ones we have with robots everywhere now, there has been innovation. We haven't been lagging behind in innovation, but we're just not very well known. Everyone thinks they know what La Poste is all about because you can go to the post office and mail a letter or whatever. But somehow we have to make it visible to other people how La Poste has been a factor of innovation in the country. I'm not complaining about the government with the relationship we have with the government. They are encouraging us to innovate. What I'm thinking is that in many countries, sometimes governments aren't providing their postal services with the support they need in order to innovate. That might be one of the messages through benchmarking, through the exchange of lessons learned and best practices. Maybe that's where we could help. Because I think that the POC is where we can really have a good discussion about innovation, but also, and Isaac was referring to this, in the Council of Administration, we could remind our government representatives that the postal services need their support. Merci, uh, Jean-Paul. Would you <clears throat> both agree with me that in a way um, COVID gave additional chance in parallel to e-commerce to the post to define the role of the national postal operator in society again? Would you agree with me with this sentence? Isaac? May we have a microphone, please, for the chair of the CA? Yes. I think that the pandemic did confirm that. But the COVID pandemic just brought those who were the most skeptical to the table, and they were reminded how important it was. Do you know, I wasn't here 30 or 25 years ago, but the postal carrier 25 years ago, or the representative of the post office, was the second or third most important person in a village or a town. You couldn't do anything without uh, the postmaster. You had, of course, somebody who was in town hall. You had your, sous, your, uh, your under uh, prefect. But, and the postal uh, agent was very important. They were an essential link in a chain of services to citizens. It was a social link between the government and its population. And now, with the evolution of technology, things perhaps have become a little more sophisticated, but e-commerce isn't something new. We used to have cash on delivery, that was the beginning of uh, e-commerce. We had uh, money transfers. That already existed in a certain format. So we did have thing. We do have email now that has been based on the concept of having a post office box. So we're bringing the information back to the deciders. We are an essential link in the chain of the economic and social development of our countries for our populations and also an actor to generate wealth. We have to demonstrate what we assert and we have to show that postal operators can help. So COVID did perhaps trigger some movement, but I should say that the postal services around the world were already key. I would be in favor, perhaps during the CA, to communicate 
in a different way with our governments. Perhaps we should try and think of what would be the best way of putting this to them. Some postal operators have already demonstrated what those pieces of the puzzle are and how we can bring our services to our population. So I'm not going to say, oh, it's a good thing we had the COVID pandemic. Certainly not. But it is something that brought a number of elements to light and that we can uh, use to work from. We put... Yes, I might see this under a different angle, but complementary to what's just been said, I think. I agree that the COVID pandemic was important and did bring innovation. There's no doubt about that, at least from the supply side of post offices who, being very close to populations, were called upon to add to the offer that they had, sometimes in, in very short periods of time that were just covering the pandemic or the lockdown periods, etc. I'm thinking of delivering groceries to people uh, in rural and isolated areas. I'm thinking of uh, having uh, medication uh, brought to people. I think that that put the postal services in a new light as useful services close to populations that were specifically useful in periods of crisis. Now that uh, expanded e-commerce, that... Hmm, how can I put this? In order for us to be able to ensure we were able to successfully uh, meet the demand in e-commerce, we had to innovate. I think that the markets, as they were shaping up before the pandemic, uh, pushed us forward, and that was when we started to have platforms. We could see that we had to improve our delivery service, our time frames, the quality of service, we have to acknowledge that, that we had to improve in these areas. And we know that there are other subjects tied to platforms that we could get into, but I think that that was what had shaken us up a little bit before, pre-pandemic. And what I'd also like to add, just to come back briefly to the question of what UPU can do, I would like to remind you all, as the chair of the POC, that the POC was in fact created in order to ensure that the postal services in the most developed countries enable the entire postal community to benefit from their knowledge, from what they had learned. That has been done. It continues to be done and it's something that we have to come back to. For some time we'd sort of lost sight. We'd put our energy elsewhere when we were looking at uh, uh, terminal dues and inward land rates, looking at the types of products that we might innovate on, expand the products that we that we had invented, but we now need to come back to the reason why the POC was created. Those enlightening words. Um, Another one, in a way, uh, also last uh, uh, question from my side would be, um, we were closed for two years, uh, living uh, uh, through uh, Zooms, uh, MS Teams and uh, tools like that, and we were in a way fed up. And I see here around now full hall again after so many years, and there is uh, David only wearing a mask, now two persons are wearing a mask, so it's... Again, uh, uh, nice to see that. But um, would you say, would you share uh, uh, the view uh, of mine in a way that these tools at that time were available even much longer ago, but now they are making our life much more efficient. And at, when they emerged during the, the COVID environment, we were like fed up, but now because of Teams and uh, uh, Zooms, 
we are more efficient. Would you, will you share with me this? Thank you. <laughs> hmm, I agree. My own personal view, and that may be because I spent more of my career in telecommunications and in the postal services, because in fact it's the same family, I can see that, <laughs> in fact, postal carriers and postal agents are very conservative and they have always been. So that's why we have to trigger innovation. Innovation isn't only about technology. Innovation is about doing things in a new way or finding new methods in order to get different results. Perhaps one of the first things we need to innovate on is to be less conservative in our attitudes. Because things already existed that other people were using, but we had to be pushed into that. And that's what made us accelerate our means of communication, our ways of working. You might recall uh, those who were in the Beijing Congress when Cote d'Ivoire had been organized in order, it had been chosen to organize Congress. We never imagined we were going to be able to vote with buttons and clicks and things. So the technology already existed, but we have to make sure that we ride that wave and stop being so, well, it's not, a bad way of working and it certainly wasn't a bad way of working in the past but the world has changed and we have a great many new constraints and perhaps we have to be a little less conservative in the way we think and act that's where the the postal world needs to innovate i learned that here we need to have further studies, we need to have deeper analysis, we have to uh, add to what we already know. In our UPU family where we want to move toward change and innovation, if all we're doing is asking for a meeting so that we can have more information and further study, well sooner or later you're going to have to do something with the results of those studies. You have to validate them, you have to implement the decisions that are called upon. While other people have already done that. So the innovation we really need to work on is to stop being so conservative. I think my favorite uh, word uh, for their study, Jean-Paul. Je, je... Well, given that Isaac was, took time to answer, I'm going to be very brief. I think you have to do both and you have to try and take the best of both worlds. I think that the physical presence we have is irreplaceable in some ways. We do need to meet because we do have rich exchange when we can meet face to face, something you can't do at home. The difficulty we have in UPU added to that is that we are here, it's 10 o'clock in the morning, but what time is it in Australia? What time is it in the United States? And suddenly you realize that for people to be able to work together, there aren't that many time frames where you can all be up and working at the same time. So we do have to change the way we work, but we have to perhaps use both ways of working together. Video didn't kill the radio star. And so I think that in fact, the two can coexist. So thank you. Thank you for the panel. Thank you for the questions. We will continue now with our program. <laughs> uh, what was a real pleasure for you and allow me just to uh, remind you that we also introduced after many years, um, uh, we want to know from you how do you feel about the setup? How do you feel about the presentation? So just scan the QR code and your opinion matters. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jean-Paul and thank you, Isaac. Alors, je vais demander au... So, I would like to ask the participants in our next panel to come up to the podium now. We have Alexander Arang, 
from Poston Nolheim. Ah no, I'm sorry. I was looking at panel two by accident. We have Mr Mwanza. Is he here? Yes, he's online. Bien, nous avons... Very good. I can see Catherine, Crimside. I know that Ms. Jafar is online. Mr. Jairo Luis Marolanda. Lascaro is here. And Siva. So I'll give the floor to Siva now. I just want to, before we start, I just want to confirm uh, both Brian and um, Ezra. Can you see us clearly on the podium? We can. Great, thank you. Brian, you good? Yes, um, I'm ex excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everyone. All right. Um, good morning, everyone. And um, it's, it's really very good to see all of you here um, in this first edition of. Uh, what's been referred to as the Postal Innovation Forum. Uh, my name is Siva Somasundram. For those of you who uh, haven't had the pleasure to meet before, uh, I'm the Director for Policy, Regulation and Markets. Uh, and in that capacity, I have some responsibilities in relation to knowledge, um, strategy, and, and innovation. Um, just before we begin and before I, I, I introduce the panelists, I just wanted to give um, some context as to why um, we're having this particular panel. Um, firstly, I think some of you may be wondering, in fact, a colleague of mine did ask the question. So in a postal innovation forum held under the auspices of the POC, why are we having a panel on uh, regulatory innovation uh, and regulatory innovation uh, in respect to the postal sector? There's a very simple answer to that, and, and, and I think that came out in the presentations made by Robert, uh, as well as in the discussions in the fireside chat. Um, I think we should all be thinking of innovation as a cross-cutting and horizontal issue. It, it, it needs to permeate everything that we do in the UPU, um, from the development of standards, uh, postal operations, and also treaties. Uh, and so in, in, in many respects, we're going to have to talk about um, innovation uh, in a regulatory context as well. Um, and this means that we've got to foster and create dialogue between all our stakeholders. And, and what better place to do it both uh, in the POC and in the CA. And in fact, uh, as the POC chair uh, and, and, and uh, Marianne had indicated, the idea is to have this forum as a regular event uh, under the auspices of either the POC or the CA uh, with themes that will be addressed and looked at by all stakeholders. Now, the second um, context for this particular panel is the fact that um, there is some debate around whether regulation in the postal sector uh, is fit for purpose. Um, at the um, conference on postal regulation that was held in S1, uh, we did have some feedback uh, from governments themselves as well as uh, designated operators and wider postal sector players that maybe uh, postal regulation is, is sort of behind the curve. Um, I think we all recognize that postal regulation needs to be in the game, but there's a question about whether it should be ahead of the game, and, and that's part of the uh, discussions we're going to have today. Because there are many challenges uh, for governments, and there are many challenges for regulators, um, from sustainability, uh, from digitization, how do we promote collaboration and partnerships, which is another theme that was picked up uh, by Robert in his, in his opening remarks. Because um, it is absolutely true that innovation is fostered when you have ecosystems, when you have uh, the ability to cross domains and, 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 and draw on ideas. Um, and so that is one of the reasons why we're having this particular panel on regulation in the context of a broader debate on, on innovation. So with those um, very short opening remarks, I want to uh, introduce uh, my panelists for today. Uh, we're very fortunate to have some very um, good people uh, who have um, given us their time. Uh, first and foremost, let me start with the colleagues who are online. Uh, we have um, 
uh, Ms. Izan Azira Mohamed Jaffa, who is the head of Korea Departmental Postal Korean and E-Commerce Division uh, within the Malaysian Communication and Multimedia Commission, uh, which is the regulator in Malaysia. So uh, welcome, Izan, and it's really good to see you. Hi, uh, thank you. Great to be here. Thank you, Izan. Uh, and then we have Brian uh, Muvanza, who many of us know. Um, he's, a, he's a very well-known name in, in postal regulation. Um, he is the head of postal, uh, the, uh, the head of the postal section within the um, Southern African Communications Regulators Association. Brian uh, has tremendous insights uh, on, on, on regulatory approaches in the African region, and, and we're really looking forward to hearing his views. Uh, and then I have with us uh, two uh, colleagues as well, uh, well-known colleagues in postal circles. We have uh, Catherine Grimsey, uh, who's principal analyst at Cullen International, who was previously uh, with the Norwegian regulator. Um, and then we have um, uh, Mr. Marolanda. I hope I've got that um, right, uh, um, uh, Hero. Um, and he is the deputy director of postal affairs uh, from the Colombian Ministry of Technology and Communication. So thank you all um, uh, for joining us. And with that, I'm going to start with some questions because I don't think we have a lot of time for some early interventions, but we'll, we'll get straight into questions if that's, if that's okay with everyone. All right, um, maybe let's start with Catherine because you're closest to me, Catherine. <laughs> um, Catherine, as I said before, um, at the S1 Conference on Postal Regulation, uh, there was some feedback around the fact that postal regulation wasn't keeping up with market developments and, and in some ways it was becoming increasingly outdated and that we're not evolving uh, with um, new thinking, new approaches and, and, and market developments. Um, one of the things that we talked about uh, in the context of the fireside chat as well as the um, remarks by Robert was that partnerships um, data-driven policy making uh, and core regulation is increasingly characteristic of many other industries and it's becoming so also in the case of the postal sector. Now in, in your view, um, what, what's your take on this and, and are, are we actually facing a crisis in regulating the postal sector? Thank you Catherine. Oh, thank you. First of all, Siva, for inviting me to speak uh, at this very first innovation forum. It's, uh, it's always a pressure to be back uh, and uh, to, to meet and greet all my former colleagues. It's um, regarding your question, uh, I think crisis might be a very strong word. Uh, we are in a period of significant change, uh, and this change is accelerated by um, uh, two key factors, the digitalization and the global upheavals we see uh, in the world. Uh, digitalization has changed um, uh, the, the face market, or facing the postal market in many countries, uh, which now are increasingly moving away from letters and more to packets and parcels due to the increasing e-commerce volumes. Uh, the global upheavals like the COVID crisis and you now the war in Ukraine, uh, it creates a massive stress on the postal and transportation networks. Uh, and this demand rapid uh, change um, and reactions uh, from the industry, which so far has been uh, uh, rather stable, I would say. Uh, and uh, now we have to do uh, maybe faster changes. Uh, so, what can, can, what can we do on the regulatory side? Is the regulatory approach a problem uh, or a part of the solution in this uh, context? As a social scientist, when I'm faced with difficult questions like this, I always try to uh, say it's like, it depends. Uh, and in this case, I think it depends on uh, the nature of the market, uh, the regulatory approach we choose, and then uh, the natural inertia of, of regulation itself. Uh, first, um, to elaborate more, uh, it uh, depends on the nature of the market. At Köln, uh, we follow postal regulation across uh, multiple markets. And what we observe is that uh, the postal markets are very different uh, in nature uh, from country to country and from regions to regions. Uh, some are very competitive uh, with multiple strong players and uh, some are not with just one uh, main player in the market. 
uh, while letter volumes are falling in most countries, this is not um, the, the case everywhere. So uh, you have to tailor the regulation to fit the market. Um, you cannot just copy paste the regulation from one country to another or from one region to another. Um, and it also depends on the regulatory approach, uh, the philosophy uh, of the regulation uh, in this particular country. In some countries, um, often where those opposed markets are rather closed with one operator uh, and the regulator is working very closely with this um, operator, uh, they can relatively easily make changes to the regulation. In other markets, uh, where the regulator is challenged by the operator, um, changes can be much worse to, uh, to, um, uh, to do. And this is also a slower way of, uh, of doing changes in the regulations. Uh, some regulators always uh, try to be very detailed uh, and specific in their regulations. Uh, Others, not so much, depending on the, on the philosophy in the country. Uh, and we study a market where the regulators has imposed 24 uh, quality of service targets. Uh, this is a lot. And other markets, we don't see that much um, uh, of such targets. Uh, what we also see is that a softer approach may work uh, in the market. Uh, by this, I mean it's um, situations where the regulator can um, avoid imposing rules, but leave to the market to, um, uh, to kind of self-regulate, uh, to, to facilitate the industry so they um, solve its own problems in a way. This can take many forms, uh, and of course it's not suitable for every situation, uh, but we see markets in the, where the regulator set principles, uh, like complaint had, had uh, marketing um, complaint handling procedures uh, that's in Europe uh, right now and sometimes with um, guidelines in addition uh, to, to give more details uh, but still it's not a regulation uh, and then the regulator only intervene uh, in detail when there are specific cases uh, that's brought on the table. Uh, we also see markets where the regulators work with the market uh, players to, and encourage uh, operators uh, to develop the industry um, self-regulation, not to impose hard rules, but to self-regulate. Um, this is seen in Europe uh, like on publication on information on quality service or uh, compensation on the del delivery delay. And I also think that the na uh, natural inertia of the, the regulation, it's, uh, it's critical. Um, we have to accept, and it's maybe right that it should be like that, uh, that reg regulation and laws change slowly, just like uh, the DGG just mentioned. They can never be as fast moving as the market itself. And the, given that this is the case, uh, one way uh, is to regulate based on principles uh, and have to fewer hard uh, written laws. So again, it's, uh, it's not a one answer that fits every situation on this. Uh, we, uh, I think we, it's nearly always a good idea to, to, for the regulations to be uh, dependent on market um, evidence. It should be open and flexible. The regulation must listen to the market uh, and based on principle to all of for change. And then again, it should be consistent and predictable to avoid stiffening the market uh, in a situation like we face today. So, thank you. Th thank you very much, Catherine. Some very important points there. And I'm going to go off script now because I think what I want to promote in this session is a dialogue. So I'm going to ask Catherine a follow-up question because I think she's made a couple of points there that are quite critical about thinking uh, 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 about innovation in the context of regulation. So you, you, you referred to the fact that um, increasingly governments and regulators in, in some parts of the world, for sure, uh, are looking at principles-based approach to regulation uh, or co uh, co cooperative approaches to regulation where there is a constant dialogue and a, a feedback loop between regulators and, and, and uh, stakeholders in the, in the sector 
with a view to developing uh, appropriate regulatory frameworks. Does that, in some ways, also provide the solution to uh, be sort of um, market responsive? So in, in some ways, I'm challenging you on the point about whether regulation does always have to be slow. Can it not, through these sort of innovative approaches to regulation, be also be responsive and in some ways be ahead of the game? Well, thank you uh, for that challenging question. It's uh, what we see, uh, especially in Europe. Uh, Europe is my market. That's where I uh, do my uh, regulatory surveillance. And what we see is uh, we have the European Postal Directive from 1997. It's 25 years old, and uh, there are some. The, the rules, very much detailed rules, are hard written in this directive. It's it's not uh, anything we can easily um, ditch. We have to, to be aware of these uh, rules and the details in the regulation. But still, um, the European regulators group, uh, they are more and more listening to the uh, stakeholders in the market. Uh, I know that uh, Jean Paul and Post Europe uh, is very uh, uh, on uh, to, to do the discussions with the regulators to see what can we do in the next um, uh, the next period. It's, we are about maybe to have a new discussion about the postal regulation in, in Europe and how can we avoid uh, the same situation to, to, to do the hard, um, the hard law and more like flexible rules to make sure that we cover all the different national needs in, in the, in the um, regulatory framework. Okay, thank, thank you very much, Catherine. Um, what I will do now is move on to um, Izan and, and, and Hero, um, because I think it's worth um, getting a, a national context of what's happening both in Malaysia um, as well as in Colombia. So maybe I'll turn to Izan first. So Izan, um, uh, you quite recently uh, introduced what uh, is referred to in, in Bahasa, and I hope I pronounce this pro properly, uh, Plan Accelerator Kuria Nagara, uh, which, is, <laughs> uh, which is P-A-K-E-J, and, and this is aimed at providing um, uh, a first-class quality of service to all Malaysians in, in relation to um, e-commerce items, uh, particularly because over the last few years you've seen you know, approximately 14 parcels per capita uh, to 30 parcels per capita by 2025, 20, which is the objective. Um, what, what underpinned the approach that Malaysia took to this? Um, and, and how did you actually go about designing a, a, a data-driven approach? Because we understand that there is a, a fair amount of uh, data analytics that, go, uh, that went into developing the, the regulatory framework. Thank you, Isa. Thank you, Mr. Samasundra. Good morning and hello from uh, sunny Malaysia. So when the global pandemic hit us back in 2020, it has uh, obviously affected the people, government, industries and businesses here in Malaysia and postal and courier industry companies are no exception. With a population of 32 million people, uh, e-commerce and parcel delivery consumption had doubled from 7 parcels per capita in 2019 to 14 parcels per capita in 2020 and we uh, closed uh, 2021 with 24 parcels per capita. So the growth of e-commerce has shown that the digital economy will be a critical part of the world and Malaysia going forward with a kegel of 24% in the next 5 to 10 years. However, it was uh, apparent to us that with a highly competitive market, uh, financial stability was a concern. Companies have seen revenue growth stagnant with increasing price pressure. And uh, delivery services continues to be a challenge as well as there is a need to improve quality of service through real-time and accurate delivery updates. There has been a significant growth in the industry and projections show that it will continue to grow in the foreseeable future. However, M MCMC's role is, and focus now is to ensure that the postal and courier industry takes the necessary steps to deliver first-class service to include access and coverage perspective as well. So realizing the challenges faced by the industry, MCMC had organized a national postal and courier industry lab in 2020. During the lab, industry participants worked closely with the Malaysian government to formulate improvement initiatives from the perspective of licensing, quality, access, and coverage of postal and courier services, as well as planning investments in high potential areas to enable more people to benefit from the availability of comprehensive and quality delivery services. 
We had engaged the postal and courier service providers, in addition to several relevant ministries and government agencies. More than 20 stakeholders from the public and private sectors were interviewed to obtain feedback and, and um, on issues, challenges and constraints related to the industry. Uh, meanwhile, the entire activity of the lab spanned across more than 100 stakeholders, representing more than 30 organizations and companies from the public and private sectors. So the finding from the final report helped formulate the strategic roadmap for the National Postal and Courier Industry, known as the National Courier Accelerator Plan Package, which is translated from the Bahasa Malaysia that you correctly mentioned just now. It is aimed at delivering improved and flexible access and coverage of postal and courier services to the consumers and merchant communities. This is through integration of end-to-end -end delivery systems up to the last mile delivery points, as well as improved courier services through the setting of industry benchmarks and guidelines of the quality of service that, to ensure consumers and business communities will receive first-class service. So the new approach formulated through lab syndication has provided us the necessary feedback for government to review the corresponding legislations related to the postal and courier industry to ensure a competitive industrial environment in line with rapid technological investment, especially in the digitalization era. With that, um, we also look into regulatory tech, which is increasingly becoming an integral part of regulator in promoting development and innovative or smart regulation for the sector. At MCMC, we drive the culture of data usage and running alongside it is to establish policies around data sharing, data classification, and overall data governance. So the main pillar of the framework is to nurture technology capabilities, deployment of data, and analytics capabilities, which includes the establishment of data analytics tools and platform, data warehouses, and self-serving dash dashboards. These analytic platforms enable self-serving analytics such as demand for data query, analysis, visualization rises throughout the organization. With the platform, users are empowered with capabilities to discover, connect to, integrate, and share the data as they need optimally. So with MCMC having these capabilities and competencies, it will lead us to having greater insights to key areas of the national postal and courier network such as network health, bottlenecks, and optimization. With the continuing technology evolution towards greater adoption of software and all areas of businesses and operations, data will obviously play a very a much bigger role to unlock more insights. Therefore, MCMC will leverage on these capabilities and competencies to drive widespread and standardized sharing of the data points by industry and network players with this in these tech-driven ecosystems towards shaping up up-to-date policies and regulation. Thank you. Sorry, is yeah. it, please, um, did you uh, want to carry on? Yeah, I just got one more last uh, line. With, with the industry-led initiatives and collaboration, as well as regulatory tech, the implementation of package is vital to ensure Malaysia remains competitive in this global and Asian digital economy. Thank you. Uh, th thank you, Izan, and please call me Siva. Um, is that, yes. uh, you know, those are really interesting points that you make, and, uh, and I picked up uh, on, on two, which I want to sort of further explore a, a bit more. One is sure. um, the, the idea of a lab uh, where the ministry actually engaged with uh, 100 over stakeholders in a, in a core regulatory exercise. Um, how different is that compared to a normal public consultation process that a government or a regulator would typically undertake with stakeholders in developing its regulations? So what's, sure. what's the distinction between a lab and a, a, and, a, and, a, and a public consultation exercise that aims to receive feedback from stakeholders? Sure. So we believe with this new approach of lab syndication, and it is a very interactive session we have with every stakeholders within the industry. So this includes our licensees, um, other uh, key stakeholders, so be it uh, industry players, um, government agencies, government uh, ministries itself. So during these sessions, we have uh, direct input coming from them, discussing challenges, discussing issues, and how strategic ways and we can address all these challenges. So as compared to probably, let's say, public um, consultation, for example, it is a very structured survey, and maybe some of these questionnaires or even feedback does not come through through a piece of paper, for instance. So we believe that the... Um, lab that we conducted has proven very effective 
in ensuring we that we deep dive into what are the challenges that was faced by the industry and how we effectively um, solve them. No, thank you, Isan. And, and, and just one final point that, that's very yeah. uh, useful. Um, uh, data sharing and data analytics are quite critical, uh, as, you, yes. as you correctly point out. But one of the barriers around um, the use of data in the context, uh, in a regulatory context, is the the confide confidentiality of that data, particularly if it's coming from different players within the sector. Um, some of it's uh, commercially sensitive. In other instances, they are absolutely critical in terms of trade secrets. Um, how, how, did, how, how did the ministry actually deal with those issues? So as a regulator, these uh, data shared with us are obviously not really open to public consumption, for example. So we definitely act as a depository of data coming in, and these data are filtered, obviously, before it's been released to the um, identified key holders, for example, industries. So that the level of data that is being shared back it obviously has been, has to be go through with a high level of sensitivity and security. Okay, thank you very much, Izan, and I will. Thank you, uh, uh, I'll take you off the, uh, the, the 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 limelight for now, and I'll okay. move to um, Hero. I hope I'm pronouncing that right, Hero. It's perfect. Thank you, thank you, um, Hero. Um, you're from the Colombian uh, Ministry. Uh, you're a Deputy Director for Postal Affairs, um, and quite importantly, um, uh, you've been uh, part of a team that has developed um, a plan around the modernisation. Uh, of, of the regulatory framework that would apply to the postal sector in Colombia. And, and this plan is meant to run from 2020 to 2024. Uh, I've heard a lot of good things about the plan, uh, and in particular uh, around the use of technology in, in trying to implement some of the objectives. Uh, sorry, in, uh, in terms of trying to reach some of those objectives. So maybe could you just walk us through the, the sort of key facets of the plan and, and what the role of data is in all of this? Thank you. First of all, thank you for this invitation to come and be in this panel. For Colombia, it's really important to be able to share the work that we've been doing over the last four years. And this enables us to explain a little bit. I'm going to switch to Spanish now rather than French. So for us, being in a space like this in the UPU as a Colombian, it's something that gives us a lot of pleasure and pride. Our postal systems have existed for 150 years and we want citizens in the world to have access to communications and we want to be able to have all of the elements of the people to be something that uh, they can feel is something that enables them to progress. We, during the pandemic, were pleased to be able to continue working for the people. Colombia has not been an exceptional case. We published recently our plan, our public plan for the sector. We have activities that we plan to implement focused on legislation, legislation that goes back to 2009, legislation has, has been updated. We wanted to make sure it was modern. Our regulatory framework has to provide to many different players uh, a framework for decision making uh, that is rather complex. And yet, it's our belief that the information that each one of those players can bring is necessary. We need it in order to bring innovation and to modernize our systems. We're thinking of two main pillars. We think of the users and the operators. The users, they need to have quality services provided to them. They need to have value added each time because otherwise we're not fulfilling the promises that we make. And we have to think of our operators because they also uh, need to know amongst themselves that they're providing the best service that they can. So when we published the plan, what we wanted to do was to look at the lessons learned from other countries as well, the United States, for example, what's France doing, what's Poland doing, what is Brazil doing, 
we use them as a reference because we think in the sector they are a good example to follow. So we update our our basic regulations and the framework trying to think about what we can do focusing on technology but innovation as we've already heard isn't just about technology but it is necessary so we're thinking about drones we're thinking about artificial intelligence we need to have all sorts of different innovations we're thinking about the users again and in our operators so what is it that we're trying to do with our new information system, reporting uh, to our operators. We want in a not very distant future in Colombia to have everyone available to have access to the information. If you have a parcel or a, uh, a postal item that's going between Medellin and Bogota, we want the system to be able to tell you as the operator, who is it that's providing this service? Uh, what are the businesses that are using it? When was the item delivered? We want differentiated information so that people can see where's the closest place for them to get that item. All of this is part of regulation and our operators have to tell us what type of information and what quality of information has to be available. And a lot of countries are looking at this. Our ministry has a number of different functions, but we also have a regulatory commission for communications. And this enables us to protect our users and uh, our designated operator and its role. So when you look at the interest of this and the interest of this type of panel as well, and you're trying to provide good service to your users, you have to think about your operators and their regulatory framework because amongst our operators we have healthy competition. We have their presence, they're part of the ministry's work and they're trying to say I'm doing the best job here, I'm doing the best job there. You also have a relevant point and that is how close we can be to uh, the different users of our system. Because when you're behind closed doors in your office, sometimes you can lose from sight what's happening out uh, in the country. But if you have direct channels of communication with people, including your operators, then you get better and more information from them. And so just to explain a very simple case that we have in Colombia, for example, we have an operator in Colombia who sat down to discuss with us what they might bring to citizens in a country like ours where we uh, do wonder about uh, getting to marketplaces. There, sometimes there's still fear in Colombia and we have to innovate. And we have to make sure that we can be that link between the operator and people, between the business and the client or the customer. And I have to be the piece of the puzzle, the postal piece of the puzzle that can get that item to the person's house. And so what we're doing is making sure we know what the expectations are, making sure that the transaction can take place. So this is partly what we're trying to do in our country, trying to get better information because we're convinced that if you get better information, then you can do away with the doubts that people have when they're making decisions. And again, that an, enables us to think about our operators on the one hand and the clients, the users on the other hand, naturally. Thank you very much, Hero, and, and some very important points that you've picked up, which, are, which were also reflected in, 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 in the comments made by Catherine and, and Izan. Um, I, I am very aware of the time limits that we've got. So what I'd suggest is we, we move next to Brian, um, and then I'll come back with some follow-up questions and open the floor for questions as well. Um, last but not least, um, Brian, um, I, I think we've all heard some national perspectives here. Uh, we've also had uh, a perspective from uh, Catherine uh, in, in her role with Cullen, um, where, as she said, she, uh, she has looked at a, a number of markets in Europe. 
Um, Brian, talk us about talk to us about um, some of the the more innovative approaches to regulation that that's taking place in Southern Africa, uh, and some of the challenges and opportunities that exist in in that context. Um, we'd, we'd really love to hear about that. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sima. I hope uh, you can hear me clearly. Yes, we can. Thanks, Brian. Excellent. Yes, um, I have been listening um, with interest to um, the other speakers and. Uh, the interpreters have to apologize. I'm afraid the quality of sound might not enable us to interpret everything. Um, Bri Brian, do you have a headset with you? Uh, yes, I do. Um, perhaps I can uh, attempt to use it now. Yeah, that, that might uh, sort of cut out the, the feedback loop. Hello, Siva. Can you hear me? Um, it's a bit better. Um, interpreters, can you? I think we'll do our best, sir. Thank you very much, interpreters. Thank you. Brian, please go ahead. Um, my apologies for that, Siva. So to, to answer your question, um, what are some of the regulatory approaches that, you know, are, are taking place uh, in, in this part of the world and um, you know, how, what is Cross's uh, place in all this? Well, um, as you know, um, a regional regulatory association like Prasa, it's, it's actually a unique platform for uh, pushing regulatory modernization um, at scale. Um, and why do I say this? This is because when member countries come together, um, they have that opportunity to not only their resources, but also their expertise um, to, to consider and resolve common regulatory issues, common regulatory challenges and issues of that nature. So in terms of um, specific activities that um, uh, ASPASO will actually undertake, there, there is no um, secret to it, Siva. Research is one of them. It, it, when we talk about modernization, we cannot avoid uh, the pursuit of, of, of knowledge. Um, I, I remember your first question was uh, dealing with how regulation is sometimes behind uh, the developments in the market. And when you consider regulation being both uh, ex post and ex ante, the ex ante side of it actually allows regulators to look ahead of the curve and create regulation that is facilitated of the direction that the market is, is, is taking, or at least the, the direction that you anticipate the market to take. So the only way you can do that effectively is actually through, through things like research. So uh, we have partnered with um, um, institutions, uh, academic institutions such as the Bits University, uh, to utilize their research capabilities as well, uh, so that we can you know, gain those uh, insights in, into the future. Sector monitoring as well, it's also very important. How we gather statistics from the operators that are licensed and how we analyze those statistics, what story are they telling us of the evolution of the sector. Those are valuable insights that we as well to inform regulation. Also institutional capacity building, and by that I mean facilitating the regulators themselves, not only with tools, but with, with skills and knowledge as well. Um, regulators that are well capacitated are actually better placed and better able to perform their functions more effectively. Uh, of course, we also uh, incorporate project management methodologies, project management you know, um, approaches to the whole uh, regulatory uh, life cycle. And what do I mean by that? I mean, you know, when we develop, uh, when we, we start from the, the process of research to uh, identifying a regulatory issue, to uh, coming up with a solution, uh, determining which instrument will be used to intervene, that whole process is managed through sound project management methodology. This gives you all the, the, the you know, the required attributes that are desirable in project management, such as the time boundness, the, the attention to objectives and results that you want to attain, the, the, the attention to risk management and, and so on and so forth. 
So that also has to be brought into, you know, how regulators do their work, and that is one of the things that we are doing. Also, uh, Seba, um, our primary output uh, is uh, regional regulatory instruments, I guidelines, if I can call it that. And these guidelines really are our primary tool for accepting modernization in regulation. And again, these guidelines are developed by the regulators themselves uh, using the research that uh, I spoke about earlier. And informed guidelines are more effective guidelines, if I can put it like that. And we are dealing with a, a multitude of topics, um, uh, several things such as universal access and service, uh, interconnection and network access, also e-commerce and trade facilitation. Those are guidelines that, uh, as far as we have produced, and we regularly review these to reflect uh, evolution in, in the market and the sector. Um, Siva, if you allow me also to speak about um, uh, uh, an important regulatory approach, which again addresses the issue of regulation being behind the sector. The, look, once you have in place a, a sound research base, you, you, research is your culture, knowledge seeking is your culture, you are actually in a position to signal the market. Not only to sit back, to actually affect change in the market, you actually signal the direction that operators take. You know, being through tools such as regulatory discussion papers on on topics that they, they may never have thought about before, to signal the fact that as a regulator, you're thinking about this. You're thinking about this direction, and it, it actually signals to operators that, look, this is a part of the market that we could actually move into. We could actually exploit this idea that has been brought about from the regulatory space. So, Siva, I hope I've given you um, a, a synopsis of uh, our approach and, and some of the things, exciting things that we're doing. Thank you, Thank you so much, Brian. Um, very, very interesting uh, points and, and relevant points. Now, um, before I sort of open the floor uh, to Q&A, some of the take takeaways that I've had from this particular session uh, um, are some, some points that I would stress uh, we might take up in the Q&A as well. One is the idea that innovation is not just about technology, and I, I think, uh, Harry, you made this. Um, it, it's really important to understand, at least in a, in a regulatory context, it's about looking at approaches to regulation, uh, as well as the uh, use of technology to try and uh, to, to facilitate it as well. And then in terms of approaches, we heard the very interesting concept of a, of a lab that the Malaysian Ministry um, uh, undertook to, to try and get hold of views to engage uh, in a more uh, co cooperative approach to regulation or co-regulation. Uh, and that sort of leads to Catherine's point that um, those sorts of principles-based approach, co-regulatory approaches might actually mean a much better way of regulating the market as opposed to um, ex ante, uh, uh, fixed in stone uh, approaches which aren't necessarily reactive. Um, so we've got quite a lot. Uh, in all of the interventions that have been made, so I thank you all, but, and I will now open the floor for questions. I think Raj is, uh, uh, is wanting to take the floor. Raj, please. I thank you, thank you, Siv. I was going to wait to see if anyone else had a question, because I tend to take the floor a little too much in this place. But anyway, I'll, I'll ask my question then. So when it comes to innovating in the regulatory craft, there's different styles that postal regulators will have. Some regulators have a very heavy touch, but they think they have a light touch. Others have a very light touch, but in fact, they have no touch. And finding the right touch of a regulator is often a very significant task. On top of the work that a regulator has to find the right touch, whether it's heavy, whether it's light, whether it's ex ante, whether it's appropriate at all, they have a wide range of stakeholders they have to work with, including the designated operator, any ministry or, or country level interests that are at play, and then of course, the customer and, and everybody else. In this regulatory mess, in this gumbo soup that the regulator has to deal with, and given the absolute devastation that's happening in the postal industry right now, 
how does the regulator find that right touch? How do you find the, the canary in the coal mine, so to speak? Thank you, Raj. I might uh, turn that question to Hero because I didn't give him a, a follow-up question after his presentation. So, Hero, over to Raj, you. that's a, a buena pregunta. That's a really good question. I wish we had an easy answer, but as far as I'm concerned, to reply, it's and uh, the task is more awareness raising. In the postal sector, and I'm speaking about my own case in Colombia, in the ministry, where it's uh, communications and information technologies, we have to think about the spectrum, we have to think about all the other different things that we have in satellites, and etc. But if you can manage to have your decision makers sit down, explain to them how important it is, and demonstrate that a country like mine is one where the postal sector has a, a large role to play with lots of people working for it, people who are going into every area of the country, then your operators uh, and your regulator can see the importance. My ministry has to be aware of how important it is. You have to demonstrate to them where the importance of the postal sector lies and how it participates. There are so many different types of regulation. There are so many different bodies. Trying to get them all to agree is difficult. So you have to try and use regulations that aren't laws uh, or, or try and adapt. Though that's one thing. But in the parliamentary debate, and then when you have the laws that are drawn up, I don't have all of the answers naturally, but what you have to do is make sure that people are aware. You have to be able to have the ear of your authorities and let them know what the postal sector is. It's not just documents and letters. It's something that can bring goods uh, around the world. And I think what you have to do is make sure that they know what it is we do. Tell them, give them a story, a, a film to think about. And so that they can see what the capacity is of the postal sector, sector is. We have to be able to tell them that story. Thank you, Hero. Um, I um, want to also ask that question of Izan because um, unlike Raj, I don't see it as a mess. I, I see it as an ecosystem where you're, you're, you're going to have competing tensions and interests. And, and the real role of governments is to try and find a, a way to balance that out and, and get the best out of all of us. So, Izan, I, I was really struck by your lab concept. So maybe could you talk us through how did you find the right touch through a lab, please? Thanks, Eva. So the entire idea of the National Postal and Courier um, Lab was to have all of the uh, key stakeholders um, basically uh, through a structured sessions. We go through areas or areas um, of uh, concerns, uh, especially impacting the industry. So under package, we have identified in total eight initiatives. On uh, one of it is. Um, we're looking at uh, licensing. We looked into the uh, implementation of base price for courier services. We also look into uh, the possibility of network sharing amongst uh, key players. So uh, through this session, uh, consulted uh, basically brought through uh, by a consult uh, consultant, we looked into uh, number one, uh, looking into the challenges and what are the resources available, but where it being from the private sector or whether it's from government, and look into how together we can come um, together, looking into possible uh, solutions in addressing those concerns. So with that um, approach, we believe that uh, everyone came into uh, this session with a uh, uh, clean slate uh, coming in into, everyone is an equal player, uh, have a say, an opinion to be shared with uh, the rest of the uh, participants. So from there, we had obviously um, the entire session was documented. Uh, it was uh, filtered. It was structured in a way to come and hence we uh, formulated the help formulate a package, which is a five, five year plan for the postal and courier industry in Malaysia. Okay, thank you very much, Isa. Uh, that's very no helpful. 
Um, I just want to let um, participants who are uh, joining us remotely that you can ask questions as well. So just raise your hand on the on the raise your hand function through um, Zoom, uh, and we'll pick you up. I think we do have a question from someone. Sorry, Brian. Yeah, Brian, um, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Steva. Um, I was just uh, actually hoping to contribute uh, to the question um, uh, that uh, Raj asked. And uh, from, uh, from my perspective, um, uh, regardless of um, how messed up um, the situation that Raj described is, um, from a regulatory perspective, there are certain fundamental outcomes that I believe are desirable to all the stakeholders. And once we consider these uh, regulatory outcomes as the basis for regulatory intervention, it is much, much easier to bring together all the varying voices of varying stakeholders uh, that have a role to play. There are certain fundamentals like the, the concept of universality, the concept of consumer protection, or quality of service, or competition management, security and integrity in the network. At personal level, we actually use these fundamentals as the basis for all the regulatory uh, interventions that uh, are developed at regional level. And we have found that once there is agreement at this fundamental level, it's much, actually much easier to work on it regardless of the question that, that comes on the table. Um, I just thought that would be uh, something that could add value to that response. But thank you, Sim. Thank you very much, Brian. It's, uh, it's so true because a shared understanding of the problems and, and the objectives of any solutions are, are critical and, and that results in, in greater consensus building. Um, any other questions? Oh, I've got hands in the, uh, the floor. I'll take uh, the gentleman from India, uh, Pranoy, please. Thank you, Siva. Uh, uh, I, I just uh, re refer to the uh, uh, panelists uh, uh, from Norway uh, about the self-regulation, and it, it is, I think, a good growing concept. And in some of the sectors uh, in India is also like social media and all, the self-regulation is being propagated. So uh, what do you uh, feel about uh, the principles which should be, especially considering that the postal sector now also uh, very closely linked with e-commerce. There are different regulations for e-commerce, as well as for logistics, which is a, a, a large industry in itself. Uh, so there are the separate regulations somewhere. And a typical postal sector uh, emerging and diversifying, uh, including the technology aspects. So there are, I mean, at least I see four uh, different uh, very closely linked areas where there are different regulatory frameworks in many countries. So in that scenario, how a postal sector specific regulatory framework based on self-regulation, which includes express industry, if I refer it to CEP industry, uh, may evolve. And uh, that should also be uh, conducive for uh, for being, a, I use the word laboratory, it was a nice word, or you can say uh, incubation center for startups. So uh, how that principles for that kind of a regulation may evolve, what are your views? Or anyone else can also come in. Thank, thank, you. thank you very much, Pranoy. Excellent question. I'll pass it to Catherine first, and then open it up to the other panelists. Catherine. Well, thank you uh, for the question. Uh, it's, um, how much time do we have? Uh, I am going to claim five minutes from the second panel because we did start five minutes late. So we've got about approximately eight minutes now. Eight minutes. Okay. Thank you. I will not spend all those eight minutes. But uh, when, uh, when we talk about the regulation of the e-commerce in Europe, uh, it's already regulated by, um, by the uh, DSA. We have this regulation on the D Digital Service Act. Uh, so in Europe, it's uh, already uh, not a hard regulation, uh, but it's already some um, um, some kind of regulation that's also the postal operators uh, will have to, to deal with. So, but 
What we also see uh, is if the market does not respond the way the regulators uh, think uh, it would do, uh, it's very easy to, uh, to go to the regulations to have to impose uh, hard, you have to do this, you have to give me the information, uh, we need all these details, uh, and then it's not that easy to go back to soft regulation again. So we see the discussions um, in, in Europe, uh, how to, to now deal with the 24 um, quality of service indicators. Uh, some of them are maybe are not that relevant anymore, but still we have to, uh, to take them into account since they're written in uh, hard law. And so it's not, uh, uh, it's not an easy answer uh, how to, to um, to deal with this in the, in the regulation since the market is very broad. And first we have to agree on uh, the, the scope of what we are discussing. And that's, uh, that's the first uh, step. So it's, um, uh, yeah, I hope it's, uh, it's okay. It's okay, did, um, did I have any other panelists wish to address that particular question? Okay, um, I don't see Yes, uh, Stephen. So Brian, go on, please. Oh, thank you. Thank you, thank you Sibba. Um, yes. yes, I was going to say um, the concept of self-regulation, in my view, it goes hand-in-hand hand with standardization. And I mean industry standards, the development of industry standards, which, you know, can be um, in enforced by the industry itself. So we, we cannot talk about, uh, um, about self-regulation when there is no framework for the sector to self-regulate. And right now, um, in my view, the most immediate vehicle through which that would happen is through development of industry standards. And again, we have to go back to the question of what are the regulatory outcomes that you are seeking? What are you looking for as a result of this self-regulation? If you are looking for uh, universality, for instance, what sort of standards can you set as an industry to ensure that that happens? Because if there are shortcomings in, in, in that standardization regime, there will always be a case for the regulator then to intervene. So I just wanted to bring that perspective uh, on the issue of self-regulation, that it goes hand in hand with the ability of the sector to develop industry standards that are acceptable. Uh, thank you, Sylvia. Th thanks very much, Brian. Um, I just have one last question and we'll wrap up the session. Um, sorry, uh, sir. We're going to only have time for one more session. I have the POC chair standing on the side waiting to take the podium, and I'm not going to keep him standing for too long. Um, the Secretary General of Papu, uh, sir, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Siva, for setting the floor to me. I will try and uh, shorten my question, seeing that the POC chair is uh, impatient uh, by his <laughs> corner there. Um, I, I, I I have a question to uh, the regulators, seeing that uh, innovation has really caused a lot of uh, havoc in terms of what they do. Um, we have uh, composite regulators uh, where they regulate the postal sector uh, and the telecoms sector, and we also have postal regulators that are just purely regulating postal um, uh, entities. But we have seen that uh, some uh, innovations like your drones, they then uh, uh, tend to gravitate towards other sectors. Like uh, you now need to bring in uh, spectrum management, which literally has nothing to do with uh, a postal regulator, a pure postal regulator. My question is, uh, to what extent do we have collaborations uh, between regulators of our sector and other regulators of other sectors uh, whose work is also overlapping into uh, our sectors? so that uh, at the end of the day, we can achieve uh, the regulatory objectives. Thank you. 
thank you, Secretary General. I, I suspect that it varies from country to country, but I might ask Hero to talk in the Colombian context how that is handled. In Colombia, we have a specificity. We're promoting healthy use for the regulatory in an area where all of these innovations are something that uh, the operators are trying to deal with in a controlled uh, arena. I'm just thinking really fast. We are looking at our regulations and we're trying to decide who is it that puts the rules into play and how do we protect people? What are the rules so that uh, we can allow new operators who want to come into the market to come in? We need to analyze and uh, smooth out our regulations, lighten them sometimes when it, they need to be. Our regulator, that is that communi the Communications Commission that has the role of the regulatory play, uh, postal player, does have uh, stakeholders who participate when we look at the different technologies and the evolutions that are taking place, and they accompany our ministry uh, of uh, communications and information technologies. They work with different operators, different sizes of operators, because it's easy for them to have technological acquisitions, but for the smaller ones, it's a little more complex. And so the ministry is one of the stakeholders is trying to promote a pilot program so that we can develop this over the next year to see what kind of technological changes we can set up with the regulatory body. We then will have a tool that is a controlled tool under the regulations that can be used. We can find out whether it's needed and see how it can be best used in the country. Thank you very much, Hero. And uh, with that, uh, I have come to the end of our panel session. I want to thank all of the panelists. And if I could ask you all to kindly give them a, a big round of applause, that would be much appreciated. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Un grand merci. Thank you so much, Siva, Catherine, Harold Luis. You were here and also our remote participants. No, it wasn't a forum for regulation. It was indeed the Innovation Forum. And we saw how innovation has an impact on regulations as well. And I really liked the last question which was posed. I think that's a really important question to ask ourselves. Let's move on now to panel two, innovation in the postal sector. What are the main challenges and the way forward for successful postal innovation tomorrow? A fascinating topic, which is going to be moderated by Wendy, who I would invite to come up to the podium. We have here with us Mr. Alexander Hanning. I'm reading the right list this time from Pustanoga. Please come up. And we also have the luck to have the president of Brazil Post with us, Mr. Peixoto Vieira Neto. I apologize, my Portuguese is far from being perfect. Online. We have two people that we know very well. Welcome to Ms. Paula Pichonieri, who is the Director of Public Policy at the USPS Office of the Inspector General. Paula, are you with us? Paola. Hello, yes, I'm here. Okay. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Welcome, Paola. Welcome back to Bern. <laughs> Thank you very much. And, and Hong Mei, are you with us, Hong Mei? Hi, hello, Jean Paul. Hello, my friends. Hello, hello, very Hong nice, Mei. Very good. nice to meet okay. all of you. Okay, good to have you. We would prefer to have you here, but we understand why you're not here. And uh, welcome, and uh, Wendy. Uh, the floor is yours, of course. 
Thank you, Jean-Paul. Good morning, everyone. So I have the pleasure to moderate this second panel on innovation in the postal sector. And in this panel, we, we would be exploring a wider variety of practical innovations that enhance the post's products and services, which is great for me because, uh, as some of you may know, I am coordinator here at the UPU for products and services. So I hope to learn a lot from this uh, session. I'm also secretary of the POC. So now that I've introduced myself, Wendy A. Tan, I'd like to introduce our other panelists. We have Mr. Alexander Henning, who has an extensive background in working in startups and consulting. For the past five years, he has led innovation at Norway Post, which is great because uh, Norway Post was voted as the most innovative company in 2019 and 2021. He's also famous for wearing brightly colored sneakers, and he's doing so today. I have those sneakers too, just, just to note. Our next speaker is uh, Mr. Floriano Pichotto Vieira Neto. And he, Mr. Nieto has 40 years experience in command and management in human resources, logistics, and operations. He has served as the president of Corios Brazil since 2019. Prior to this role, he was Minister of State, Head of General Secretariat of the Presidency of the Republic, and a member in two periods of the UN Peace Missions component in Haiti. I think you're gonna have a lot to share about, with us about innovation. Now online, we have Ms. Paula Pisioneri, who is the Public Policy Director with the USPS OIG Research and Insights Solutions Center, RISC, that is the acronym, and RISC explores strategic ideas for ways to enhance the viability and efficiency of the Postal Service. She joined USPS OIG in 2011, and her team has published numerous white papers covering a variety of global and domestic postal poli policy, innovation, operational, and strategic topics. You can find a lot of these uh, research papers online in the OIG's uh, website. And last but not least, very important, Ms. Hong Mei Dong, who I'm sure most of us know. She is the management, Managing Director for International Business at China Post. We all know she has extensive knowledge in the UPU activities and many years experience in international postal business and operations for China Post. She is also currently the Vice Chair of the POC. So now let's get down to business. I'm going to ask our, my first question to Paula Pisioneri who's online. And Paula, I hope you're ready. <laughs> okay. Yes, I am. Thanks, good. Is, so the question is, is postal innovation just tech or much more? Considering your experience, what has been the main areas of innovation in the past few years, and what factors are critical to successful innovation? You have the floor, Paula. And first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to this panel. It's a very timely topic, and I'm always happy to talk about innovation, even when it's still night out. <laughs> so, but back to your question. So, postal innovation is definitely uh, much more than technology. Uh, Non-tech innovation, such as uh, uh, business model innovation or innovation in the design of processes, networks, or customer experiences, has been as impactful in our industry as technological innovation. And one successful example that comes to my mind is work sharing, which has been a really a true game changer uh, in the US market. Um, however, what emerged from our research is that over the past few years, technology and especially digital and operational technologies, together with advanced data analytics, have indeed been the main uh, drivers of transformation in the US postal and logistics sectors. And um, the, um, the investment in technology of the U.S. carriers and logistic players have been directed mostly at expanding, uh, improving, and further automating uh, their capacity to process packages, uh, and also improving the delivery performance, uh, including offering uh, same-day and, and next-day delivery. And as for data analytics, uh, we saw an increased use of advanced data analytics tools, especially in operations, to both increase uh, the visibility and control across networks, and then um, better predict uh, uh, volume and volumes and workload. And um, also the Postal Service has stated in its 10-year uh, plan that intends to invest uh, 20 billion, which is uh, half of the planned capital investment, 
uh, for the next 10 years in its mail and package processing network. Um, so, and in the U.S., as I think like uh, uh, everywhere, COVID has been an accelerator of innovation and changes in not, and innovations that, that normally would have taken maybe years to deploy have been implemented in, uh, in record time. Think, for example, of all the new uh, contactless products and services that were developed almost overnight to address customer concerns uh, uh, about health and, and public health policies. And looking at the practices that have allowed the carriers to quickly respond to these COVID-related challenges, there are many lessons learned that could help speed up innovation processes in general. So what are some of, of these lessons? So, so first, the, the go came from the top. So the need to implement change and do it fast was a priority shared at all organization levels, from senior leadership down to the uh, unit and field levels. Directions were clear. Everybody in the organization acted in response to clear needs, objectives, and, and expectations. And then uh, cross-functional coordination uh, was essential to uh, fast implementation. So having dedicated project management teams composed or representatives of the various units involved in key initiatives who directly report to senior management significantly helped speed things up and break silos. And also relaxing certain internal processes and bureaucracy, which was done to react to the emergency also helped, as well as an increased uh, uh, tolerance for failure. And then finally, data analytics and demand forecasting functions were key in driving uh, operational uh, decisions. So although there is uh, not really proven formula for success, applying uh, these practices, and each organization can do that in their own way, can help the pace and the success chances of innovation initiatives. The, however, um, I think there is a type of innovation, the more forward-looking, the more destructive, uh, focused on less proven ways of doing things, so they might not thrive in this structure framework. For that type of innovation, I think uh, a scan team, almost isolated from the rest of the company, who thinks without restrictions and has a larger room to try and fail, um, might be able to generate like those groundbreaking solutions the more structured approaches might not deliver. So separating the two processes like the structured innovation from like the more destructive innovation uh, might be a good idea. Thank you, Paula. Thank you. You gave us really a lot of information in, in your intervention. I really appreciate that. Um, some of the takeaways you mentioned was um, that innovation should come from the top and that there should be given clear direction and cross-functional uh, coordination is very important. And I really liked increased tolerance for failure. I think that that's important as well when we're taking on uh, new technologies and new innovations. But now let me turn to Brazil's experience and let me ask uh, Floriano, because also Brazil is a huge country. So I'd like to know that in your country with such different geographical and economical, uh, economic realities, how is innovation being used by Corios to ensure the universal access to services and goods and to reduce the gaps between the different regions? Thank you very much. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. And this is our daily challenge. As you mentioned, Brazil is a huge country with five different natural regions, so five different cultures expectations, desires, and this condition interferes a lot in the way we're doing our business. And Correios is the only institution which is present in all cities and towns of Brazil, a number of about 5,600 municipalities. But also Brazil is the first country to introduce 5G technology in its communication uh, um, I mean, uh, resource. And this condition will help us a lot to, to answer everyone demands no matter where I mean, they are or he or she is. So to deal with this, we, we think that beyond technical and technological uh, services, we must have an uh, initiative approach or change a little bit what we do in our business. And for this reason, we, we 
uh, reinforce very much the, the sense of customization. In other words, we put customers in the center of everything we do in our business as a way to compensate that difference that we have already mentioned before. So in the past, we used to tell our customers what their needs, their expectations should be. But today, they tell us exactly how, when, and where they want the need to be answered. And then, uh, we need to, to rethink, to, to change, and that's the way that we strengthen very much the sense of, of customization. And when you talk about customization, uh, innovation is something uh, essential, is an important part of it. And just to highlight this relation, the relation between the two concepts, I bring some examples of Correios to illustrate them. I'll start with uh, Correios Import, which is a single window where customers uh, can find everything they need to import their goods. For example, information on how to deal with, with Correios, how to follow customers' guidelines, directions, and everything else. So customers can buy whatever they want, no matter where they are, using this new platform. Another example are the lockers. We have installed lockers all around Brazil, and this new facility, this new service, help a lot of customers to access um, their products, again, where they are, no matter where they are. Um, late delivery, delivery at the next door, uh, changing or reviewing routes, last mile routes, based on traffic algorithms. These are just a few I mean, examples on how Correios have already inserted innovation in our business. But I go back to the first idea of customization because we strongly believe that customization is the secret to, to answer customers in the exact way they need us. And there is no way to disconnect customization from innovation. By the way, it's the opposite. We need to put these two concepts together to have a better purpose in answering our customers' expectations. Thank you for that. Customization. I think we have a new uh, word in the lingo of UPU. I think that's a great Ooh. word. And as you said, um, Customerization is beyond tech and innovation, and it's really the way we should do our business. And the, the examples you gave of uh, Corio's import and lockers and delivery options. But another thing that our customers are asking us for more and more in the post is um, focus on the environment. And now I'm gonna turn to you, Alexander, because recently we celebrated World Post Day with a focus on environmental sustainability of postal activities. And we know that Norway has been forward-looking in this respect. Could you tell us how innovation is helping design a greener postal customer journey in Norway? And particularly, what's next in this area? Well, that's a really good question. And thank you, Wendy, and thank you, everyone, for having me. So we're part of the problem, all of us. Ten years ago, Norway Post, we were 2% of all of Norway's CO2 emissions. 2%. The airline traffic was 3%, to put it in perspective. Huge problem. But we invested a lot in, in green technology, electric cars, electric trucks, and now we're down 50% in 10 years. So we're down to 1%. And we continue that journey, and that's very important, of course. But it's a bigger problem, uh, and that is a lot of the big problems in the world, like CO2 emissions, like biodiversity, clean air, it's all linked to one thing, and that's material extraction. We extract materials and use them only once. The world is now 8.6% circular. That means that 1% we use it once and throw it away. And that cannot continue. So we need to move the world from a linear economy to the circular economy. And you mentioned my shoes, and these are actually made from recycled ocean plastics. 
And that's the way forward. So that's the good thing is that we see a path forward to a more circular environment, a circular economy to, to help their environment. But the good thing for us as postal operators is one thing is that that still needs transportation. So when they pick this plastic out of the ocean, it needs to be transported to a factory that can make it into a yarn. And then they move to a shoe factory to make it a shoe and then to the store to sell it to me. So that means we need a lot of completely different uh, products and services to support the whole, whole society into a, a more uh, circular economy. And of course, when I want to sell them, why can't I use your lockers in Brazil? And I can put them in a locker and then someone else can buy them from the locker. I mean, we need to use the capabilities we have now in new and different ways. And the last example I want to show you or talk about is e-commerce. And I'm sure a lot of you bought a lot of stuff online during the pandemic. And usually you get a big box, don't you? And you open it and there's a lot of plastic wrapping and plastic and there's a small product inside. Is that a good feeling? No, it's a, it's a bad, like you talked about the customer journey, that's a bad customer journey. And it's bad for us as postal operators because we move a lot of air. We can pack our trucks much, much more compact and reduce our CO2 emissions if we can reduce the size of the box. And a lot of us sell packaging, like we do in all our post offices, we sell packaging. So we already sell packaging. But moving to the circle economy is not only about recycling, it's about reusing, repairing, and getting, uh, actually innovating on business models, getting new in business models. So actually we developed uh, this together with e-commerce uh, so, uh, stores. This is a reusable e-commerce packaging. So an envelope made out of uh, recycled plastic. It has a Velcro, you can open it. And we can sell this not as a product to e-commerce stores, but as a service. So an e-commerce store will actually uh, have this as a service so they will get the supply of these. They will fill their products. And then the customer, they can send it to the customer. Of course, the customer, if there's something wrong with the product, they can return it back to the store in the same packaging. Or they can put up a gift in it and send it to a friend if it's a birthday. Or if they don't want it, they can actually put it empty in their mailbox. We'll pick it up, we'll clean it, and then send it back to the e-commerce store. And this is the kind of business model innovation I think the post sector, need, we need more of. Thank you. Thank you, Alexander. I, I really can relate to your story about receiving a big box with a little item inside and the feeling of you know, guilty that, that I ordered this and it came that way. So seeing your new packaging is really interesting and I hope that it's something that other posts take on as well. You also were talking about uh, reuse, repair, new business models regarding e-commerce. And now I'm going to turn to, to Hong Mei from China because we know that uh, China is uh, considered as one of the most innovative postal and logistics markets in the world. And I'd like to ask Hong Mei, uh, why did China leapfrog over the last two de decades and where do you see China post in the coming two decades and how will innovation support this journey towards the next generation of postal services? Hong Mei, you have the floor. Uh, uh, Wendy, excuse me. Ah, okay. Hong Mei, go ahead. Uh, excuse me, Wendy. Uh, okay. Now I can hear you now. Okay. Could you repeat your question? I'm sorry. Certainly. Sorry, Hong Mei. So, as many consider China, as the most innovative postal and logistics market in the world, why did China leapfrog over the last two decades? And where do you see China Post in the coming two decades, especially how innovation will support this journey towards the next generation of postal services? Okay. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you for your question. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm very happy to join this discussion. And I would like to share with you that for, for China and China Post, um, for, the, for the past decade, we have been enjoying for a fast growth of the CAP market, not only for China Post, but the, but the whole industry. And the main driven uh, factor is the uh, e-commerce, not only uh, cross-border e-commerce, but domestic services as well. 
And I would like to share with you that for last year, the CAP market, uh, the, the traffic volume is over 120 billion pieces for the uh, CAP market. And most of the traffic are driven by the um, e-commerce e -commerce market. Uh, so, and, and the second layer I would like to highlight that for China Post, we are living in a very competitive world. And the logistics companies have been growing very fast for the past decade. And for cross-border uh, e-commerce players and also the uh, uh, logistic players, they have been growing even faster for the past five years. So, uh, in, uh, but actually uh, for China Post, for domestic services, our market share is only about 10%. So we have to, you know, innovate every day. According to the our chairman of the group, uh, he says that we must innovate. Otherwise, we cannot survive with mm, we cannot survive in this industry. So every month we have a monthly analysis, and we have to compare uh, with the uh, in integrators, the competitors, and we also have to react very quickly to the market. And as uh, uh, as Siva mentioned in the panel one, that innovation is not only technology. And for China Post, we, we believe that the business, business model innovation is more important. And I would like to share with you some practices. I cannot say best practice, but some practices of, of our international services. So the first is the line haul uh, innovation uh, for the past uh, few years. As we have uh, all experienced the, the pandemic, you know, after the outbreak of the pandemic, we have lost most of our air capacity. So we have to change uh, through the um, air conveyance by the passenger trains to the charter flight and also the self-owned uh, capacities. As you may know that China Post, we have our own, you know, postal airlines for both the uh, domestic and also international transportation. In the past, we focused mainly on the domestic transportation. And after the outbreak of the pandemic, we, we are now expanding to the um, international line haul transportation. And I would like to, you know, express my sincere thanks for the for those postal operators who have very close cooperation with China Post for the past few years. And I would like to share with you that we are expanding, you know, our self-owned uh, airlines in the next few years to have a more stable line haul solution. And the second uh, I would like to share with you is about the um, uh, the tailored uh, solution to our customers. In the past, our postal product like packets, no matter a small packet or e-packet, used to be popular uh, for, the, for the merchants or the marketplaces. But for the last few years, they have changed their business model from 3PL to 4PL. So our you know, postal product is are not the very popular to them they have better control for the logistic fulfillment. So under such circumstances, we have to you know, have a solution, tailored solution to our customers, uh, no matter merchants or the marketplaces. So now we have started to provide with them, uh, in addition to the current traditional services, we provide door-to-door -door delivery, door-to-port, port-to-port, Based on their uh, based on their demand, so and even sometimes we we have developed the uh, you know uh, logistics fulfillment together with our customers. So this is uh, another um, innovation we I would like to share with you. And then uh, the third uh, innovation I would like to share with you is that about our import, because uh, for for China. Uh, we not only uh, we are buying globally and also sell globally. So uh, we um, we have a lot of uh, import traffic for China Post based on the current postal uh, customs clearance. We cannot satisfy the needs 
uh, for for our customers because the Chinese people used to buy you know high value goods from the overseas countries. So based on these circumstances, we have provided uh, not only postal customs clearance but also the um, cross border e commerce clearance. This is created by China Customs and also the general uh, you know general international trade um, uh, clearance. So uh, we are very happy to um, develop these services together with our postal partners. And if you have the interest, please contact with me or my colleagues anytime. We believe uh, we need to work together and tr try to you know survive in this very competitive uh, world. So this is uh, some information I would like to share with you at this stage. And you, if you have further question, I'm happy to take. Thank you, Hong Mei, for that. Um, at 120 billion pieces of e-commerce per day, I'm sure you do have to innovate every day to survive in your industry. So, so thank you for sharing with, that with us. And also bringing up the need to uh, innovate in, in business models, that, that was very, very interesting. And having said that, I'd like to turn back to Floriano and now ask you, in light of also what Hong Mei has said, to assume you are a successful startup entrepreneur in postal and logistics activities in Latin America, what would you bring to the postal and logistics market? And this is a very um, important answer. I'll try to summarize some ideas. I would bring the necessity to reach everyone according to his or her uh, specific demands or desires and this takes me back to that concept of customization uh, for Coheus customization today is the most important word as a second idea I think that uh, helping uh, our customers and partners on how to synchronize their the use of, of technology so we can make our space, Latin America, a, a common arena to discuss everyone needs and ideas and situations. In that sense, I believe that uh, the postal network is an important tool because it can put together persons and businesses no matter where they are in a very deeply discussion. But I also would like to add some examples on how Brazil is responding to the growing uh, demand of cross-border e-commerce. Just to give you, gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, an idea, Correios today will have three international centers which are not supporting the cross-border demand. So, um, up to, to the, the next year, December of the next year, we'll have three new ones. By the way, two of them will be inaugurated this year, until December of this year, and the biggest one will be ready to operate uh, next year, in 2023, in Sao Paulo, I have already signed an MOU with the administration of the airport of Guarulhos to have a space of about 100,000 square meters. And then we double our capacity to answer the cross-border demands. And we believe that doing that, we will be also ready to, to help to, to, to relate with our neighbor countries in what they need in terms of also cross-border uh, demands. So this is what you think about it uh, and in the way that Brazil, the role of Brazil play in, in, in South America regarding to this growing and important cross-border demands. So it's all about, again, cross-border demands, customerization, pleasing your customer. As Hong Mei said, tailorizing services, 
using innovation to tailorize your services to to uh, please your customer, to satisfy your customer. Mm -hmm. So now, Alexander, I'm going to turn to you, and I'm going to ask you to assume that you are not a postal customer in 20 years from now. What would bring you back to the post? Oh, that's an excellent question. And uh, we, a lot of us are old organizations. You're 200 years old. We're 375. La Post is four, no, 400 and something years old. And I think we're at a, a crossroad now that we need to stay relevant. Because if I'm not a customer for 20 years, it's going to take a lot to get me back. So I think that's the big challenge for all of us is how can we still be relevant for customers? How can we still be in contact with customers? Because as you know, with e-commerce, when the, when the customer buys from the e-commerce store, and they might not even see what the name of the, the logistics company is, if it's the postal company or some competitor, and then it's delivered in a, maybe a multi-user locker. They don't know who put it in the multi-user locker, or they, develop, they put it in your mailbox, they don't know who put it in the mailbox, then we're invisible. And I think that's a huge challenge for us to actually be still owning the customer relations, still be, be a part of that. So for one instance, what we've done is we have express delivery drivers in all the major cities in the Nordics. We had that for many years, and of course they do business to business parcels delivery. Uh, but we saw what else can we use that capability for? And one idea was that there's a lot of small stores in the city center. People live not that, you know, outside in the suburbs. Can we connect those small stores with the consumers through our express delivery, like a Fedora, Uber Eats kind of thing, but as a marketplace. So we created a, a new brand called Amoy, and we connected as, as a digital platform, so we have the customer relationship. The customer goes to our platform to order. That's new for us. We're not used to owning the customer in that way. People who order will actually collect from multiple stores, so unlike Fedora, who is you know, one restaurant to one person or he breeds one person. You can actually buy across from all these small stores, like cheese, um, butcher, bakery, and get one single delivery at your home. And then we actually get a cut of the, of the profits, in addition to getting paid for delivery. So we both own the, uh, the customer, we take the payment, we get a cut of the, the, the sales, and we also get paid for delivery, which is business model innovation. That's what we all need to do. Thanks, thanks, thanks for that. That was really, really interesting. Again, though, very customer-centric, innovation, driving uh, ways to improve your customer service and the customer experience as well. So, so that's great. And um, I think that now I would like to turn to Hong Mei and just ask her that taking to, into mind that we're living in this digitally open uh, world with trade, who do you think are going to be the greater, uh, the winners of this greater openness through international postal exchanges? We keep talking about cross borders. So who, who do you think will be the winners? Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for your question. This is a very difficult and interesting question. And, uh, uh, but I, to my understanding, uh, you know, uh, if we want to win the future, uh, we have to follow three perspectives. The first is customer perspective or market perspective. And the second is the competitive perspective. So we have to be, you know, we have to stay very competitive. And the third uh, should be the best practice perspective. And we have to learn from our, you know, competitors and also the best practices from the industry. So I'm happy that, you know, um, POC for this session has started to, you know, to study the, the new business model uh, like B2B2C and I hope that we can work together to have more, you know, uh, solutions based on the changing market and customer need. And I hope that, you know, UPU by the joint effort of, of all of us you will be the winner as a whole. That's my comment. Thank you very much. Thank you for that, Hong Mei. So the customer perspective, uh, competitive pr perspective, 
best practice perspective, very important. And also recognizing that the POC is uh, using innovation and, and new business models, recognizing the, the proposed B to B to C uh, product development that we're working on, and also saying that you hope the UPU will be a part of the solution. So keeping that in mind, I'd like to turn to Paula now and ask Paula to assume that you are the UPU DG. What would you do to support innovation in the postal community? And as the first female DG, how would you support women's participation in innovation? <laughs> what an endeavor. Uh, so, um, well, a few years ago, I had a similar assignment in real life when I had the opportunity to set up an innovation pra practice at the, uh, at the OIG. So um, based on that experience, so my first step will be uh, the creation of the Innovation Center in charge of managing uh, uh, an innovation program. And this is a step that the UPU is already undertaking, uh, so through the ongoing creation of an innovation lab and of a knowledge center and think tank at the IB. And I think this is key to give ownership structure and direction uh, to the innovation initiatives. Um, then I will make sure that uh, uh, the process of defining uh, the, the portfolio of activities of the innovation team be an iterative one, including uh, a member country's perspective on how the center could better support uh, their innovation needs, which I'm sure will be very different from region to region. And then, however, um, the activities of an institutional innovation center like uh, the IB1 will be are generally organized around four pillars knowledge creation, best practices exchange, training and promotion. And um, there are several initiatives that uh, could be undertaken under these uh, four pillars. And just to offer some examples of what uh, these like uh, innovation and research teams could do, uh, they could, for example, conduct research on the major areas of innovation and, and innovation priori priorities in member countries. Uh, uh, they could map innovation trends in the industry and also regularly monitor the evolution uh, of member countries' uh, innovation practices. Uh, and this could be done in the form of a, a periodical survey of uh, both uh, postal operators and maybe consultative committee members. Uh, it could be done through partnerships uh, with ac academic institutions uh, and, and, other, and other entities. And the outcome of these research activities uh, could be a periodical report on innovation trends, priorities, and best practices in the global postal and logistic sectors. And this will also this this information will also help the UPU innovate its uh, product portfolio accordingly. Um, the UPU trained post could provide the training on innovation practices or on how to innovate uh, product uh, and, and, and processes. So, um, so to um, shed light on the major techniques to do that. Another idea is uh, creating a sort of like a mentoring program uh, facilitated by the, uh, the, the, the UPU where posts with the higher level of expertise in innovation will be matched with the uh, less experienced one. So this could take the form of like internship or uh, details of experts from like posts that intend to develop innovation activities to posts that uh, have a, a long-standing uh, innovation units. And finally, um, there, there could be like an annual innovation award, the pricing the best innovation submitted by members. Um, but now to tackle the second part of your question, so as the first female DG, I will be uh, definitely focused on bridging uh, the uh, gender gap in innovation, which is still uh, significant. So uh, women um, still like submit less patents. They are underrepresented in the IT and digital related industry, which are those that drive innovation, but even like less female funded uh, startups. Um, and one general policy is to address the gender gap and, and promote uh, female leadership in the workplace can help. Addressing the gender gap in innovation will benefit from some specific uh, measures. For example, going back to the initiatives uh, uh, to promote the innovation in the postal community that I mentioned before, each of these actions could have uh, um, also initiatives to increase uh, female participation in innovation. For example, when launching a survey to map the status of postal innovation in member countries, uh, specific gender-related metrics uh, and questions could be added. Um, the exchange of best practices could, between posts could incorporate like practices to assure, assure 
uh, gender balance in, in innovation teams. Uh, uh, train Post could offer specific uh, training modules targeting women, and also internship opportunities could be uh, reserved to women. Um, a potential UPU award that could have like a category highlighting uh, uh, female innovation. And then I was also thinking that maybe uh, when the UPU Quality of Service Fund awards uh, like funding to projects on modernization and innovation, those that have me female like uh, uh, representation in the implementation team, they're maybe like score higher just to offer some ideas. Well, thank you very much for that, Paula. That's a lot of uh, very good practical information. I'm glad to see that uh, at least the UPU is uh, on track. We, we have now just initiated a new uh, innovation center and think tank in, in the DPRM, so, uh, which you mentioned would be good. And also, we, you know, taking into consideration the four pillars were definite that you mentioned, the knowledge, best practice, and training, uh, I think we're on the good track. I really liked your um, proposal to make an annual innovation prize. That might be some, that, that's very interesting uh, thought as well. That was fun. <laughs> <laughs> so now it's the time that we get to open the floor for uh, questions from the floor. Um, so I hope that uh, there will be some. Oh, there's way in the back. It's Walter Trezik, the chairman of the consultative committee. You have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much for recognizing the Consultative Committee. I have a very specific question, and um, I guess it was not touched upon today. Uh, the postal uh, sector is a very people-centric sector, so our employees are most important. Um, how can we ensure that um, <clears throat> all this, this new environment uh, technology coming in um, does not... Um, create a situation where they're left behind. Um, inclusion is very important, yes, but it's a people business. We need to ensure that they're educated, they're on track. I think innovation without our people out there serving a daily fantastic uh, service is highly important, and I think we should include them. Thank you. Which one of our panelists would like to answer? Florian? For you? Yes, I just would like to, to say that you cannot reach innovation. First, innovation is not technology. It's innovation and a wheel for doing things. So you have to change the culture. You have to change the mindset of the folks that work I mean, for you. So there is no way to separate uh, employees or our, our force of work, I mean, working force, from innovation. They have, they need to go along uh, in the same track. So once you change that, uh, the company will be extremely benefit with the innovation. You can put your personnel inside the same boat and having them together to reach the steps that you have already planned for, for the future. We have this experience in Correios. So there is a, a deeply, a very huge communication, deep communication between the administration and the workforce to a very tuned, synchronized communication between the two sectors, just expressing, showing them that the company can not go along, go ahead, even having new communication, I mean, innovation technology as part of the innovation without the, the working force and engagement. And we are succeeding on that with a great level of cooperation. Is that good? Great. Any, is, is there, would anyone other the other panelists like to add anything before we go back to the floor? Yeah, sure. Um, so as uh, Walter said, I mean, innovation is uh, first and foremost like uh, um, a, a, a person-centered like endeavor. And, uh, um, so sometimes what really uh, prevent, prevents like innovation to flourish in an organization is a very, uh, a very human feeling. It's like a, a fear, fear of like a career impact, of criticism, of like failure, of dealing with the uncertainty. And then uh, so um, what can be done to really uh, encourage innovation in postal organization and mitigate these fears? Uh, so I would say that uh, uh, making innovation an explicit requirement of professional success 
is uh, one possibility. For example, at the um, here at the Office of Inspector General, so uh, innovation and ability to lead change is part of, of our uh, performance uh, uh, evaluation. So it's one of the factors. Um, then it's important to uh, framing innovation, and this is to come from leadership, because this is really leadership like task to do that, to promote an innovation culture. So framing innovation is uh, fundamental to the organization success. And then it's important to give recognition and, and, and reward the innovators. And then it's important also to uh, make innovation like the norm, establishing routines like innovation days, hackathons, uh, and uh, so meeting free days where people are like free to uh, to think. So we have these initiatives within our organization. We have uh, hackathons, innovation days, uh, and sometimes they're just internal for us, internal to exchange ideas and come up with ways uh, to innovate with the, the work we do. So take the fear out of uh, innovation and normalize it in the, in the workforce. Great. Um, oh, Siva, I see you're asking a question. Mm. Sorry, Wendy, and I didn't mean to impose, but um, there are a couple of points that I think are worth sort of thinking about a bit more. One is um, the point that Paula made, and that is um, how do you create space for people who are engaged in thinking through innovation in an organization? Uh, and by space, I mean two things. One is uh, the time and resources, that's one. And the second is um, a culture which recognizes that you're not going to get innovative solutions, business models, technology, without the investments that are required. And those investments take a fair bit of time before they are realized in terms of benefits. I'd love to hear from Paula as well as Hennig on this, because I think you know, some of the more innovative organizations do recognize this, and, and it's important. Thank you. So we'll give the floor first to Alexander. Uh, thank you for that question, Siva. And uh, this is kind of the core of all corporate innovation. I do a lot of um, keynotes and speeches for other corporates as well as, um, as postal companies. And the, the key thing that separates those who succeed with corporate innovation from those who fail is corp uh, CEO buy-in. If you don't have the top management and the CEO with you, because it takes, as Siva said, resources, it takes time to develop, you need to have not only you know the people who's going to run away and find up new uh, new ideas, right? You also need to get the rest of the organization, the operational side, with you. So when they come with a good idea and say we want to try this as a terminal or try this as a, a post office, if they say sorry, we're we've been measuring quality only and we don't have time for you, then the innovation dies. But if the top manager says you're going to take some time because this is important long term for the corporation, then you can succeed. Thank you for that observation. Before going back to Paula, seeing as we have the CEO of Brazil Post with us, maybe we can ask you if you think that that is true, that you have to have the CEO buy-in for innovation. No, uh, as I well, have said before, innovation is not, can be not confused with technology. I, I, I understand very much what has been said, and I have no words to to compliment, but I do like at the end of this this um, conversation, I do like to address a few words to the UPU related to innovation in the, in other in another sense. Uh, Paula, would you like to address a question? Yeah, sure. So, so to to get the buying of uh, leadership, so it's important to uh, demonstrate uh, that uh, these uh, innovation initiatives uh, have benefits. Uh, Leadership wants to see a return on investment. Uh, they want to be able to easily track uh, the uh, the progress of the innovation program. This means that it's key to focus on tracking and reporting the right innovation metrics. Uh, for example, uh, alignment with business strategy, uh, impact on cost and revenues, competitive uh, uh, competitiveness, and, and, and agility gains. Uh, level of risk involved, effort required. These are like the most popular metrics uh, that help qualify and quantify the value of an innovation program. And this will uh, help reassure executives uh, that innovation is going to where it really matters for the business. Uh, and there is a clear vision of the benefits and the risks involving in that. And once trust in innovation has been gained, then it can be brought a little further uh, each time. Thank you, Paula. 
Uh, is anyone else asking for the floor? Does anyone else have another question? Oh, yes. yes. The United States. Thank, thank you, Wendy. Uh, I just had a clarifying question for Hong Mei, and thank you for sharing uh, all that information about the innovation at China Post Group. I, I just wasn't quite sure I understood um, one of the um, uh, uh, comments that you made concerning um, the tailored solutions, and you have changed your model. I thought it, you said from 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. Is that like a time of day for acceptance, or is that something different? Thank you. Uh, I think uh, uh, I meant percent. So three. Uh, so we did, were two percent of Norway's total CO2 emissions, and we reduced down to one percent. So. No, I think the question was for Hong Mei. Yeah. Hong Mei. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Similar <laughs> names. <laughs> Hong Mei. You okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the question. I'm sorry. I didn't uh, make it clear when I, you know, uh, speak la last time. So uh, the changing uh, from uh, 3 PL to 4 PL is the strategy from the customers, especially the marketplaces. For example, for the marketplaces, they used to, you know, use our postal product and we, we have control the end to end service. But currently, they have more control of the logistic fulfillment, so they call the 4PL, and we can only provide part of the services. Like, for example, they, they can only, uh, for example, they have their own air capacity, then we will only provide part of the delivery or part of the collection. And for some of the customers, they only, you know, want to use our air capacity, then we can pro provide services you know, from port to port. So this is the major changes. We can only provide, you know, part of the services. So we are now selling solution or service instead of a traditional postal product. I hope I clarify your question. Thank you. Thank you, Hong Mei. Now, as I see the POC chair is waiting there, I'm just going to give Floriano one more chat to, to close yes, for us. Excuse Thank me. you very much. I'll be very brief on Excuse that. Me. But I Speaking about innovation, I'd like to thank the UPU for the strong support provided to Correios in the implementation of the RFID pilot project, which has happened for, for years as part of the quality of the of service fund. With that support, now we have implemented the RFID technology in all uh, treatment or sorting and distribution centers uh, within Brazil. So uh, this is a good opportunity to again to thank the, you for that initiative. And we took that opportunity to innovate uh, as part of, of progress, as part of the evaluation of our company. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for that, and it's a nice note to end this panel, uh, noting that the UPU is supporting innovation in our member countries. So, and so thank you for that, and I'd like to thank all of our panelists for this lively discussion this morning, and I think they deserve a really strong hand of, uh, of applause. <laughs>
Second thing is, again, your opinion matters. So please take the survey, take it, and we would like to share it. And from uh, um, uh, a part of the executive management, Metoki-san and myself, we have here today that uh, the managers or the management, they should support innovation. And you have the promise from our side that we will support innovation also in this building. Second thing, I was in a way very much impressed by the speakers. Uh, uh, two were in a way very impressive for me. The CEO of uh, uh, Brazilian Post, where are you? Okay, uh, I hope this is like a start of a new uh, friendship and we would like to hear and see more of the successful CEOs in this building. So thank you again from uh, my side. The second one was uh, the guy with the excellent shoes. Uh, Alexander, uh, I'm amazed. Thank you for sharing this. Uh, I can advise you already. Uh, you can start to look for a half tax tax. This is a ticket which gives you a discount in Switzerland for railways. And another one is, do they have it in the yellow color as well? Okay, so next time in respect, I will wear yellow shoes if I will be a moderator. Enjoy it. It was a pleasure. Thank you very much. Just to say thank you very much and bon app. We'll see you this afternoon at 2 o'clock for the plenary starting in this room. See you then. <laughs>